Yes, we are live, episode 54, In Class with Dr. Gray Carr. I'm Karen Hunter. We're here today to talk about the royals, the African royals. Oh, yeah. yeah that, I was like, yeah, I messed you up a little bit. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sick and tired of listening to people talk about the royals. I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm over it. But, you know, during this conversation, and we had uh, Dr. Shola on my, my radio show on Sirius XM. And of course, I talked about it after. I, I didn't watch it that day. I watched it the next day. And then I was like, this is all about uh, colonialism, oppression, like, Yes. All right. So I said, Dr. Carr, can we can we have a conversation about the true kings and queens? What does it mean to be a king and queen? We call each other kings and queens. We come yes, from we do. royalty. Yes, what we does do. it mean, uh, you know, outside of the bastardization, you know, outside of this, this, uh, this, you know, it's like my, my best friend in college, her mom, uh, they're, they're from Bermuda. So I spent a summer in Bermuda my freshman year mm. and her mother was a school teacher. She talked about going to grad school in England. And how the school, I think it was Cambridge, put all of the African and Caribbean students in a room and taught them how to brush their teeth. Now they're looking at these raggedy mouth, st- brown stained, missing teeth, thick, crooked, you know. A little bit. And, and all of the Africans have the beautiful piano keys. How about that? Yeah. And they're like, you're going to tell us how to brush our teeth, how to clean our teeth? Look at your mouth. Of course. But that's the, the backwards way in which we are following behind something that is behind us, mm. something that is not as good, not as pure, not as, mm. uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, I they're do. the bastards of the kings and queens of Africa. That's I just do. All right. I do. Well, I mean, there, there there's uh, there's so many different directions to take that in. And, and as we were talking uh, about the nature of how societies organize themselves, we know that Africans had and, you know, the first forms of human government. And so it's hard to think about those things with everybody else in your ear. And so that's why even as we developed this very, very broad set of questions in in our Africana studies framework, we came to the realization that we had to do something at the threshold in order to lower the volume on all this static coming from every direction. And so that's why we created those first two categories and those first two questions, the social structure question, you know, who are Africans to other people? What societies, what political economies, what structural arrangements do Africans find themselves in at any moment? And then the second question, which is the correlate question, which is the the, the tandem question to that first question which we labeled social structure was governance the governance question we ask is who are these african people who are african people at any given point in time who are they to each other now i have to make a very important uh note here social structures exist because human beings have to figure out ways to live together that's a very basic thing The concept of governance, which might include ethics, culture, protocol, custom, all these things, uh, it can be a lot less formal. It's a lot more intimate. And and of course, the first interaction we have in terms of governance is the familial interaction, the family interaction. But let's not make any, uh, let's not labor under any illusion that either a social structure question or a governance structure question when we're talking about Africana studies is anything other than an attempt to get to deeper questions of how to be human in the world. In other words, we're not talking about a black system that has existed immutably throughout time and space. We're talking about attempting to grapple with human questions of living and dying and being and what's good and what's not good in a way that allows us to to draw out from the experiences of African people, useful experiences and contributions that can be contributed to human development and indeed to to, to our our continued existence on this ball without the stigma, without the assumptions, without the labels that have been used to try to thingify human beings who 
were connected to the continent of Africa over the last 500 years. So this isn't an attempt to create something that is artificial and doesn't correlate. People say, oh, well, you're trying to make all black everything. No, everybody calm down. And I think the example you gave is a very good example of why we have to develop a very specific set of tools. In the academy, we might call them methodologies. In the university system, we might call it a discipline. That's why I say people who are saying they're doing black studies, you're not doing black studies if you're just studying black people using the tools from somebody else. Because what you're doing is importing all those assumptions in. And it's the equivalent of having people with perfect teeth be told by people with no teeth how to brush their teeth. That's what you're doing. And anybody who says that you're not doing it, we should have that conversation. In fact, come on over to the narrative side. That's where we're going to have that rich and spirited conversation. But yeah, just the pause. No, no, I, I can't wait. I forgot to say good morning. So, oh, yeah, of course. Good morning. See, <laughs> protocol. That's good. the governance question. Who are we yeah. to each other? We, we always are family. No we are family. Let me say hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for being a part of this experience. Uh, I am made better because of it. And I am humbled that we have the opportunity to have these conversations because I spent my whole life not thinking about myself through any other lens but the lens that I was taught in school. As did okay. I. Which is through those no teeth people telling us with perfect teeth how to brush our teeth. Right. And this is, you know, and, and maybe I'm leaning all the way in because I am, because I'm excited to, to, as I say, flip the tables. I was talking to Kareem earlier and I said, this is not about rearranging furniture. This is about flipping the tables completely. They are doing something really, they have done something really horrible, horrific over the last several hundred years. And we no longer can be polite about it move a little thing over here, make a little reform over there, throw some money over here. This is about flipping the tables and completely upending the system of oppression. Uh, that is global, apparently. So so let's let's have that entry point of the monarchy that everyone's obsessed with. Yes. And let's start talking yes. about uh, kings and queens of old. And, you know, I, I was thinking about the first time I met Hesepsha, and I know I'm probably not saying that correctly. Uh, yes, 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 yes. And because, you know, we, we talked about Cleopatra before. And it was like the first time I was like, there was a pharaoh that was a woman? And what? And Zinga? And by the like, way, in, in the Medinetra, in the Egyptian language, in hieroglyphs, per ua, per means house. Ua means great. Per ua. It is not gendered. In other words, pharaoh does not mean king. It's a very important point. To understand. So no, yeah. Even that, even how we... Are conditioned to think about that's right. Men sit on thrones as kings, women are queens. That is not African. Nope. So please enlighten us, Dr. Carl. Well, well, I mean, you know, when we think about uh, in fact, give me a second here, and what I will do is give me about five seconds, and what I will do is uh yeah. This is um this is house. I'm just drawing it for you so everybody can see right quick. My colleague and brother, Mario Beatty, you know, we, we were all taught by Theophilo Benga. So if you look there, uh, per means house, wah means great together. Per wah means uh, the per wah means the great house. And we pronounce it uh, as Pharaoh, mm. but that does not mean king. They have a word Nesu, which can be used uh, as king. The Nesu, which is, well, I don't get too deep into a Metanetra lesson. If y'all want to learn Metanetra, sign up for narrative. And uh, as uh, uh, look, I'm rocking my jewel now. Let's be clear. <laughs> Let's be clear. Narrative. Learn, create, grow. Let's be clear was the favorite phrase of our teacher, the great Theophile Obenga, who is still alive, who has just uh, helped open uh, uh, what, what they're calling a Pan-African University in Congo, uh, the University uh, Denise Sassoon Gueso, who is the president of uh, uh, Congo Brazzaville, which, you know, this cat's name is stuff for themselves. I mean, I'm holding my nose, but I know Benga is at the center of the curriculum and development, and they're going to come from all over the continent. And in fact, we could go. But uh, while we are rejoicing in that, not even a month uh, uh, it has been open. Dr. Obenga, who's one of the greatest living intellectuals in the world, who was our teacher, would always say when he get down to the brass tacks, bon, uh, good, you know, okay, the French speaking Africans, he would say, bon, let's be clear. 
<laughs> so, 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 so let's be clear. The concept of rulership, where we see Hatshepsut uh, and Pharaoh, uh, the Pharaoh would have uh, five names. They had her title, uh, a Sat or Sa, Ra'a name, daughter or son of Ra name, uh, various names. One of her names was Mary, uh, um, uh, Mary Kare, beloved is the soul of Ra. And so um, it's very important to understand that, no, 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 not beloved, not Mary. Not Mer, Mer or Mer means love. In fact, I should pause here. I'm giving y'all meta nature lessons this morning, but uh, this afternoon, but uh, I'm going to show you this one because I love this particular glyph. It's very important. Mer, which means love. Here, there you go. See that? Mer means love. But M, this, this is a picture of a backhoe. This is the R, which would be a phonetic complement, meaning you use the R to emphasize what is ultimately a, a, a biliteral, two consonants here. So you don't really need this, but when you see this R here, mer, it means to love, but the symbol for love in this phrasing of love is a backhoe, meaning an instrument through which you labor. So love ain't, man, I like how she look, or more, I love that dude, I mean, no. Love means you have worked with and for someone. <laughs> so the whole concept of, romance in the western country. this is why we have to at least that's why we had our third category ways of knowing what ways did and do african people generate to contribute to the world to comment on how they view the world so uh one of the one of these concepts love for example is not uh anchored in this notion of desire in the way that we think about it in western societies it is uh it is anchored in the idea that we will build together so at any rate i misspoke however on uh uh, on Hatsips, it's one of her names. It was not Mary, love, but love is the soul of Ra. It was Ma'at. Woo, Ma'at Kare. Woo, Ma'at is a difficult term to translate. Some people, uh, many folks have tried to re have tried to at least contain much of it in elements that kind of fracture when we start putting Western labels on them. So people would say truth, reciprocity, balance, order, right. And all that's true. But my eye is a principle that really the physicists would probably have a, a much better time trying to grapple with the idea of my eye. My eye is a concept that basically says, um, you know, my eye is, for lack of a better term, you know, I, if we, I hold a pencil up and drop it, they would say, that's my eye. If you say something crazy, and we all be like, I oh, didn't feel good. People say that was my eye. In other words, every action has a reaction. So if you want to get good in the world, if you want to create good in the world, you must put good into the world. If you want the world to go sideways, you say something or do something sideways and watch the thing spiral. So what the Egyptians, they would look on this society and say, of course, they stormed the capital. Are you not paying attention to the behavior? In other words, that is my eye. You know? <laughs> in fact, they had a, another term, isfet, which people sometimes translate as chaos, but that's a difficult concept to grapple with because the Egyptians would say, ultimately, ma'at is all there is. Even when the thing looked like it's going off course, it will ultimately resolve itself. That is the principle by which they tried to live by trying to create a society that was more and more in harmony with ma'at, which is why harmony is one of the things. But they won't get too far away from that. Hatsip Sut, who comes... Uh, it's difficult really to talk about Egyptian chronology and we'll get too deep into it today. Again, come over to the narrative site because we got some first rate scholars, world scholars who are going to really help people walk through. So if you're, if you're enjoying this kind of breadcrumb, come on over and we're going to have a different kind of conversation over there because we can walk through these. And I'm just going to mention this, for example, when we think of ancient Egyptians, we usually think in terms of the periods that were forced upon trying to narrate Egyptian life over the arc of over three millennia, over 3,000 years of co co continuous societal development. Uh, usually we hear the word dynasties, for example. And this is going to be important in a minute because, again, I, yeah, I mean, I watched, I finally, you know, did one of those three o'clock in the morning joins and watched, you know, Oprah and uh, what, what's uh, Megan and what's her husband? Harry, I guess, the three of them talking. And so I, I got to watch it at some point. But, you know, so talking about dynasties. And that and typically dynasties, the way the West constructs them and the way they've been constructed generally go through bloodlines. The Egyptian descent from Pharaoh to Pharaoh to Pharaoh went through the mother's bloodline. In other words, it was what some people might call matrilineal. Right. So in other words, who, who your mother is determined whether you would sit on the throne. 
And there were some significant breaks in that chain over the arc of 3000 years. There were going to be uh, Cleopatra, you know, with the Ptolemies being one, which we talked about, by the way, going back and look at that episode. Uh, we talked fairly extensively. Um, Hatshepsut, you're going to see emerge in what they call. So so here's here's the thing very quickly. I mean, um, you see a distinction between what they will call um, kingdoms and periods. Kingdoms are like unbroken moments of uh Again, using the word king, which is not, you know, germane, but it's the language we have now forced into our mouths. Uh, parenthetically, I saw you and Larry were talking about, you know, the Oxford, uh, not the Oxford English, I don't know if it's the Webster or the Oxford that's going to bring some some of these words from quote unquote African American vernacular English into the dictionary. And I'm like, that's cute, but you know, we don't we don't need any legitimization from you. But at any rate, so you got old kingdom, middle kingdom, new kingdom. Between the kingdoms, they have what they call, they try to periodize Egyptologists, what they call, they put in uh, what, what, what we call um, periods. The periods are moments when you can't really trace the baton. So old kingdom, this is what they call the pyramid age. So you got Snefru, you got Khufu, Khafare, Menkare, you've got uh, some sisters who assumed the throne during that period. That's the old kingdom. This is what most people would be most familiar with. If you don't know anything about ancient Egypt, just think pyramid age just the pyramid age the bent pyramid of snefru uh the red pyramid at dashur all these places that i've been many times with my with my colleague mario Beatty and sam livingston and Belithia watkins and so many we go every year the plague has interrupted us but we going back because they're getting ready, getting ready to open the grand egyptian museum so we you know now are these perfect societies hell no but you don't build a pyramid with whips Slaves didn't build the pyramids. These are basically national capital projects that are worked on most heavily in the periods when they are not farming because the, 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 um, the society was an agrarian society. But there's a period, roughly speaking, about a three month period when you can't farm. The, the Nile is not flooded yet. You haven't been able to you know, wait for the waters to recede, plant, harvest, this kind of thing. Four month period, really four month period. But so they work on these capital projects. That's the old kingdom. And that's also the period where we get some of the early Sebaid, what they call the teachings of Tahotep, for example, Kagemi, some of the oldest stuff right there, the so-called pyramid text, the coffin text, very important statements on how these human beings in Africa viewed the world. And these are not Arabs. There are no Arabs in the Nile Valley at this time. These are Africans. In other words, they look like the people like who are in this conversation right now. Okay, let's just be clear. Um, then you have what they call an intermediate period. You've got some invasions. You've got some people coming. You've got fractured lines. Some people ruling here. Some people ruling there. Then you have what they call the Middle Kingdom. The Middle Kingdom is going to take you, roughly speaking, um, you know, 2200 BC. The Old Kingdom, the pyramids are up by like 2700. That's also a name you may have heard before, Imhotep who was a vizier, who was a high official uh, a genius, a brother who, you know, designed, among other things, the Step Pyramid at Saqqara, uh, been there many times. You know, you may have heard the name Imhotep. That's Old Kingdom. Then you get an intermediate period. Then you come up into the, roughly speaking, two, 2200, 2100, 2000. This, during, it, during it just period, just before that, you have this intermediate period. Then you have the reemergence of the stability. And they're always talking about unity how do we unify how do we bring people together again the nile valley is over three thousand miles long so imagine a society where they're trying to unify everybody along that long river that splits in what we call the now the sudan so uh during that period of reunification you see the emergence of cats like amenemhat whose hair title whose birth title whose name title was uh wahemi mesu wahem is a term that means uh that, that, that translates as repetition Mesu, Messi is a picture of three fox skins tied together that women would use when they are assisting or delivering children. By the way, uh, you see women physicians, which isn't a big deal in Kemet. Pesheset, for example, Dr. Obinga wrote a major essay on that, Lady Pesheset. Uh, he called it because he said, you know, you people in the West are always looking about first stuff. So the first, the first woman in a woman physician in world history, of course, not the first woman physician, but we have a record of her. By the way, what we know about Egypt, we know from the writings, and those writings are a tiny fraction of the written stuff. Most of the stuff is gone. It's just that they wrote on they wrote on rock, they wrote in granite, they wrote in the walls that are still there, and some of the things they wrote on papyrus. You know, this is an Egyptian invention. This paper, um, 
that stuff because of the climate and where they buried some of the stuff survived. So, I mean, but we have only a fraction. So Pesticet is one of the, the female physicians we know. And I hate to say female physicians. In fact, let me just strike female. Uh, one of the physicians we know. And uh, so so she, uh, the, those who would assist her, in, in, if, you do, if you're delivering your children, you would tie a fox skin around your waist. Three fox skins tied together. You tie them around your waist to help, you know, so, you know, the blood, whatever, you know, mucus, this kind of thing. So to so that word that 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 visual became the glyph, the the sign the sign for the word birth. So a minimhat seeking to reunify the Nile Valley in what the Egyptologists call now the Middle Kingdom took as his her title his Horus title, uh, Wehemi Mesu. That translates literally as repetition of the birth. Now, we'll get this very straight. Repetition with him. From the Latin to now through the romance, so-called romance languages, through the English to now, re, again, okay? Mesu, to be born or birth, naissance. From Nasi to Latin, through French and other romance languages to English, birth, re, naissance. Renaissance. Stop calling it a new black renaissance, Ibram Kendi. We got a word that was ancient before they even made up the language called Latin. Okay? Wehemi Mesu. Retire the term renaissance. Let's be clear. Because what the Egyptians would say is anytime we got to restart, we must now go back into our memory, our collective social memory for the best things we could we had going before the thing got disrupted. And we will bring those best things forward along with the lessons of what didn't work. And as we are reestablishing unifying, we will have a better society than before. So a minimite, I like a minimite. A minimite with him in the suit. I'm bringing it back together. The Middle Kingdom lasts very, very short. This was this was a period that, in many ways, was favored by uh, one of our Jegnas, the great Jacob Carruthers. Uh, Carruthers loved the Middle Kingdom. Maybe not the first time I heard him speak, but over the years, many times, uh, he would talk about the Minimite. He would talk about the Wahimi Mesu. In fact, that's an operational principle that we we could talk about. Well, again, that's what narrative is for. So come on over there now. Then you have, after a brief Middle Kingdom, you have a, and the Middle Kingdom is kind of known for its, its literary uh, achievements. It's known for its intellectual work. So if you want to call it a Harlem something, call it a Harlem Wahimi Mesu. <laughs> In other words, because that's going to connect you not to Shakespeare. So you're looking for a black version of Shakespeare. August Wilson is the uh, African-American Shakespeare. Shh, shh, shh. <laughs> Maybe August Wilson is with Hemi Mesu of Tao Tep. Oh, yeah, yeah, because we was doing this while y'all still trying to figure out how to cook uh, food, which is no problem because eventually you got it. But let's be clear who was first. And he, first ain't even what we angling for. The longer you've been around, the more lessons you should have for everybody to draw from, which is why we're even having this conversation. It isn't to keep it bottled up in black communities. It's to, hey, everybody be quiet for a minute. What were we thinking about? Okay, everybody, here we go. Guess what, England? You're telling us uh, how to brush our teeth instead of asking a question. How come your teeth ain't fall out? At which point we contribute to you with Hemi Mesu. We give you how we do it so that guess what? Now you get to keep your teeth. But see, you came in here thinking we emerged out of midnight with nothing. You who emerged out of everything, you made up a grease, you made up a wrong, you tied yourself together, and now you're sitting there toothless with a stick with some brush on the end telling us what to do, and we standing here with the stick in our mouth chewing, and you can't figure out that what you're doing is something wrong with it. But that's not your point. Your point isn't whether there's something wrong for, for it. The point is, it's yours, and that is how power intervenes. They understand that very importantly because, you know, you want to put some words from African-American vernacular English, so-called African-American vernacular English, what the linguists would call and the psychologists would call Ebonics. You want to put some in your dictionary. You're not doing that uh, to be generous. You're doing that to maintain control. You still want us looking in the dictionary. This is this is all about ideology. Bill Cosby said this years ago. A language is a dialect with an army and a navy. It's about power. 
It's not about knowledge. So at any rate, so then you have this middle kingdom. Then you have uh, the so-called new kingdom. That's where you find Hatshepsut. That's where you find Ma'akare. You see an intermediate period where there are more invasions. The Amu, for example, uh, who the some Egyptologists refer to as the Hyksos. You get some invasions from the Mediterranean side coming in. You have some coming in from the Libyan desert. You have some coming in from over by the Red Sea. They're, they're encroaching in the Nile Valley. And every time this would happen, the restoration of unity, the attempt from leadership would usually emanate from the south, from Menefer, uh, uh, what we what, what what the Greeks would call Memphis. That's why you got a Memphis, Tennessee, by the way, by the banks of the Mississippi. They're echoing what they would call in the south, you know, architects, ar architectural uh, historians. So they call it the Neo-Greek revival with the, uh, the building structures in the old plantation south and what comes after that. Well, the idea is they're making up uh, a culture based on gestures toward the Greeks, but the Greeks themselves are borrowing from the Egyptians. Uh, but at any rate, we'll get too far down there. Again, that's a, that's a story for another day. So, or another side, come on over the narrative. So what you see then is that um, this reassertion of power comes again from up the Nile, coming down to, I'm um, coming up toward the equator, I'm saying up going this way, because if it were a 3D map of Africa, the Nile runs from the Sudan and e well, Uganda through the Sudan and Ethiopia meets up in the Sudan and then runs down into the Mediterranean. I'm going this way because if it was 3D, you would see Africa is like a big T. It's like a it's like a, a vast interior plateau up here and this way. And then it slopes off into the waters. So the Nile comes from the highlands down into the Mediterranean. So at any rate, what you see then is... Um, Early in the, with it, by now we're in dynasties like 18. Because even though they can't number them, they try to make up numbers to kind of put things together. And all this, by the way, is kicked off in the Ptolemaic period, which is a lot later. But anyway, we'll get, I'll maybe like I say, talk about this another day. So, New Kingdom. You've got some cats like, um, wow, New Kingdom is fascinating. You know why? The New Kingdom is probably one most people know the most about, but you wouldn't call it necessarily New Kingdom unless you study this stuff because those are the figures you probably heard the most about. The new kingdom reestablishes order early on as a cat named Amos, wife named Amos Nefertari. Um, the interesting enough, uh, you know, Amos' mother is a soldier. In fact, we've seen her battle medals. They're in the uh, Aswan Museum. You go down and you see these bat like they're gold flies. You win, they give you like a necklace with these like they look like flies, but they're made out of gold. Their wings out of gold. She had these battle medals, man. And then of course you see the Saku. Saku is their word that you would call mummy. Uh, they didn't believe that you were coming back to life in that body. So retire all that stuff, whether it be the rock or the mummy, the mummy returns. All that stuff is European imagination. In fact, there's a great book called Egypt Egyptomania, where you basically see when they start stealing stuff out the Nile Valley, they include stealing the bodies of these Egyptians. And then they take them to Europe and do stuff like crunch them up, make powder out of them and make elixirs and say, we're drinking this to revive our bodies. I mean, y'all kind of weird stuff. So don't be looking for weird stuff in Africa. All human beings got their weird stuff. Y'all stuff, I'm saying not y'all. Europe stuff was crushing up African bodies and drinking them like there was a, come on now, come on now. And stop calling black people cannibals. This whole nother day. But in any way, especially when you got rituals like take, eat, this is my body. Don't get cute. So <laughs> what you see then is take, drink, this is my blood. Okay. And y'all know what that first Sunday is about. But so you see almost in them, almost never tarry in them wage war, expel the Hyksos out the Nile Valley got to do that. In fact, uh, or, or the Amu, as they call them, is there's an instruction, there's a Sebae that survives called the uh, the instructions of Mary Kare. This is a guy who was telling his son what to do and not to do, and he's got a line in there, low the vile Amu. In other words, low these vile invaders, these wretched invaders. He said, why? Because, say, you know, food propels their legs. They fight since the time of Horus. In other words, when you are unstable, when you ain't got no place, you always fighting. You always beefing. He said, these are these people. They come from other places because they just constantly on the move. They don't know where their ancestors are buried. They they live to fight the next day. And they've been fighting since the time of God. <laughs> In other words, they just been fighting. All so we got to low get rid of them. As they expel them, then you see the next iteration of bloodline come in. And this iteration is intersected by 
military. Military, military has been around long. We got have had people for defense, for expansion. You know, human beings are human. None of us are exempted from the foibles, the, the flaws, or the triumphs of being human. So you got beef. You got beef throughout the Nile Valley. I mean, you that's a whole nother. We had to talk about Ramses the third, Mednet Habu. You talk about a harem conspiracy. It's all kind of stuff. So you, come on over to the other side. Dr. Beatty will walk you through that because I'm telling you, he, he Dr. Beatty has us out there in that hundred something degree sun going through the temple, looking at the conspiracy on the wall. It's like, man, because you know, some of these cats got to go. You see that happen. So and and as you as you're talking about that, we will have a field trip. It will be a class trip. And it was interesting. Somebody in there was like, I would get a C minus in this class. No, you won't, because we're not we're not using Eurocentric measures. No. Nope. Your knowledge is it cannot be defined on on a scale with grades That's and right. things. This is the flipping the table that we're talking about. That's and right. before you get too deep into, you know, the, the Egyptian, you know, the, the whole idea of kings goes beyond Egypt, right? For, oh, yeah, oh, no question. In fact, let me just let me tie that up right quick. We won't we won't spend much. But since you mentioned Hatshepsut, I just wanted to walk us right up to her because the new kingdom is the period of Hatshepsut. So after Amos, you've got trusted lieutenants in the mil Egyptian military who are helping to win this fight. Who are then because the bloodlines have been disrupted, who take over the 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 role of Periwa. And I'm just going to name. Uh, a couple of them very quickly. Uh, Seti, Seti the first. I like Seti for some reason. Seti is crazy. Seti's off the chain. Set or Setek, that's their name for what we might now call Satan or the devil. Honestly, Set is the first one. Seti's the first one to take that name as a pharaonic title. He comes out the military. It's, it's crazy. Um, you've got Amenhotep the third. I mean, Hotep the third is a very important character in, 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 in Egyptian narrative. He is the Periwa. His wife is named T. You've know if you if you look up T, T I Y E, you're gonna look her up and be like, oh my God, she looks just like Lauren Hill. She got the afro, everything. T and I'm in Hotep the third have uh their 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 child, their son, I'm in Hotep the fourth decides he's gonna change and T was a hell of a diplomat. There's a whole story there. In fact, I, I'm a, I won't even hmm, I gotta. Just got a when I was there the last time, a couple years ago, I got a new book on Amenhotep the third, but I'm not gonna I'm gonna leave that alone. Um Amenhotep the fourth decides I'm going a whole nother direction with this. I don't think that Amun should be the name for the large principle of God. I'm gonna change it to Aten, the sun. So I'm changing my name from Amenhotep the fourth, I'm gonna change my name to Akhnaten. Really, and a lot of times they would marry to expand their the stability of the uh, the polity. They would marry into folks who weren't Egyptian. In this case, Agnaton marries a young lady named Nefertiti. So everybody wearing them Nefertiti things and worried about what color Nefertiti is. Nefertiti was not Egyptian in the sense she wasn't white. There ain't no white people in this conversation, okay, <laughs> at all. <laughs> centuries away, millennia away from white people. So, uh, so Harry and all rest of y'all, we you know we coming to you in a second, bro. But you ain't nah. We don't even know what y'all your ancestors doing. But this is all this is all taking place in Africa. But he's going outside the Nile Valley. Their uh, next generation, because Agnaton, and I'm not gonna get into Agnaton much. I'm gonna come coming to half tips it. Uh, Agnaton kind of goes quickly, and then they restore order. Because after Agnaten, you see uh, Tunakamun, the living reflection of God, Amun, not Aten. Who is that? That's Amahotep III, T and M grandchild. So y'all know him as King Tut. Every time you say King Tut, number one, King, not a word they would recognize. Tut means reflection. So what you're saying is King reflection. Name is Tunakamun. Tut means reflection. Ankh is life. That's the triliteral right there on my hand. Amun, God, the living reflection of God. In other words, they, they, they give him these broad titles, right? He doesn't live long. He dies. Some people say he was killed. He was sickly, whatever. He's replaced by another one of the military cats. You got I, then you get Horam Heb. And out of, after I and Horam Heb, who are military cats, that's when you see Seti. Seti's son is Ramses. Ramses II. 
Ramses II is very important because he reigns for a long time. And then after that is when you see, ultimately, uh, you get Hatshepsut. Uh, Hatshepsut is very interesting. She builds her mortuary temple. Been there many times. She builds her mortuary temple on the other side of where all these New Kingdom cats are buried. So when we go to the Nile Valley, you can go to Tunakamun's tomb, Seti the First tomb. You see uh, Jehudimos, who is very important, another military guy. Jehudimos is supposed to be on the throne, but Jehudimos is too young to take the throne. So his half sister Hatshepsut says, "I'll take it until you get old." He ages into it, and she keeps the throne for decades, <laughs> which is one reason why after she makes transition, he mad. He tried to chisel her name out of everything, but he can't. Why? Because she goes on the other side. You got to go back around the other side to the back of the mountains where they built the tombs for most of these cats. You go to the other side, and there's this huge mortuary temple that she designs and builds into the cliff. It is incredible. The designer of her mortuary temple was her lover, a cat named Cinemut. Y'all make some movies. Make some movies about this. But nah, no, nah, you know what? Be quiet. Narrative is going to handle that. Because y'all, Hollywood, y'all done, y'all been to mess this up. You won't talk about Marie. It won't be love in that sense. You've been made it into some damn romance and then tried to uh, get Brad Pitt in blackface or something to play it or Angelina Jolie, whatever. So y'all, y- in fact, forget I said that. So at any rate, about you making the movie. So the lover builds it and then she allows him to be buried right there at the mortuary temple, outside the temple, though, outside the mortuary temple. So at any rate, the new kingdom, I'm going to pause there with this final comment and then go to the broader part of Africa so we can have a, in fact, I'm going to make this connection between the British very quickly um, in the next three minutes because it's going to take me about one minute to say this. What you see in Egyptian narrative is a very familiar theme of bloodline descent, but understand that the Perwa is responsible for maintaining the order of the society, hence the te- hence the name, the great house. What is the house? The polity, the society. So the responsibility isn't to do whatever the hell you want. The responsibility is to coordinate, as John Witherspoon would say, coordinate. You got to coordinate. And so each in the vi- and the valley is divided into regions. They call them uh, seped in the ancient Egyptian uh, gnomes. So you think about a gnome. It's like a state. And it's tied into their ways of knowing because each of the states, each of the gnomes, each of the seped have names of the uh, representations of the divine that are in that region. And when you make transition, you stand before the throne and you say, I have not stolen. I have not uh, deprived the, the widows of, uh, of shelter. I have not uh, uh, I made sure the hungry were fed, the naked were clothed. You say all that stuff, and then they weigh your heart and decide whether or not you tell them the truth. That it, sounds familiar. That that's sounds- what they, exactly. Oh, I'm sorry. That's exactly right. There were there were 42 at the apex of these sepeds of these gnomes. So you would say, you know, so and so, whichever gnome, I have not deprived the widow of bread or something like that. So and so. There were 42. So think of like 42 states. It's a tough comparison, but everybody grasps that, right? Then you have a group. They were still not clear when they were there or even if they were there, who subsequently say they were enslaved there. They built everything. There's no record of them in the Egyptian, but they said they were. That's fine. And then they say that they escaped with the help of their God and that as they were leaving, the people kept worshiping the other thing. So uh, their leader, Moses, Moses, Messu, Messi, to be born. Oop! did I say Jehudi most the third? Yeah. The name Moses is Egyptian, but we know that. Anyway, not Hebrew, Egyptian. So, maybe he comes down, he says, they're worshiping the golden calf, Het Heru. Het Heru, the house of Heru. She is the wife of Horus. And you see her, you see Horus, her name is a box, and inside the box is the falcon. Who is the falcon? Heru. Fight since the time of Horus. Her name is Het Heru. So people say, well, that means she's subordinate to her husband. Nah, I stopped listening with ears trained by the West. Het Heru is the house of Heru. Meaning what? You know what a woman is to a man in that society? You know what your wife, it don't, it's, this means wife. It don't mean wife. What The word for wife, uh, one of the words for wife, Himech, is a picture of a well full of, full of water. You, the, the house of Heru means, bruh, if I'm gone, you out here naked with no place to be. Live, eat, drink, nothing. You're out. 
So next time y'all listen to Teddy Pendergrass, oh, 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 I miss you, miss you, miss you, baby. That ain't no blue. He said, I swear I didn't change. He said, I know you didn't heard it 10 times or more. Why? That's Heru asking for the house of Heru. In other words, I can't make it. I'm out here. It's a different mentality when you know the uh, know the genealogy, when you know the, the ways of knowing. It's a very different concept. Anyway, so Het Heru, House of Heru, she is also depicted in other forms as a calf or a cow. The golden calf, that's that's what this what the, what the Hebrews are doing, or those who would now identify as Hebrew are doing, is they're creating a mythology for themselves, a way of knowing for themselves. But in order to do it, you look at the uh Egyptology, uh, Egyptologist Jan Asman, who's written a number of books, God Against the Gods, uh, just a whole number of books. He would call that a second order religion, meaning what? First order religions, first order ways of knowing, as we would say, to expand that concept of religion, are things people create out of their own cultures. A second order religion, a second order way of knowing is people who were born into that first way, want to create a new way. So then they create their own way out of materials they drew from that. But the, the break is they say everything came before the way we're saying it now is a lie. So that moment of smashing the golden calf is the way the Hebrews saying we reject the Egyptians. Then they turn around and fuse the 42 so-called declarations of innocence into 10 and make the first one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And then in Sunday school, this is how you get put out. When they say that, you'd be like, wait, there were other gods? Be quiet, get out. Anyway, the second one, and then it go on, why? But each one of them next ones, the mother nine, came from the Egyptians, but they had to have the moment of break. That's what Asma calls the second order religion. So, pause, rulership, monarchy, that's one model. We use it because it's old as hell. We have records from it. It's African, which gives us a point of departure. People are always saying, why y'all picking ancient Egypt? Why don't you talk about West Africa? Okay, let's get this in right quick. Let's take 10 seconds and say this very quickly. Both and, not either or. Okay, so got that one. But then you look around the continent, and this is what Chancellor Williams is writing about in his book, The Destruction of Black Civilization. People say, well, Destruction of Black Civilization is flawed. It's not a history book as much as it is a philosophy of history book. All the, see, there's a difference between history, which is an attempt to narrate the past, and you can't narrate the past. Everybody's got different opinions, and so you read a book and think you know. No, that's one opinion based on sources that you picked out, and all this stuff is too much stuff to remember everything, so you're narrating. They're narratives. Then there's historiography, Historiography is the process of writing, the process of narrating, the process of making those choices. Then there's, you know, some people might say historicity, meaning what? How do you see yourself in time and space? So you got memory, you got narrations of memory, and you got self-awareness of what has happened in the past and how you fit in it. Now, those are, that's just one way of thinking about it. So when we look at the ways human beings organize themselves on the continent we call Africa, and we start looking at ideas of governance and heads of state, kings, queens, however you want to look at it, we realize that there are a lot of differences. There are thousands of different groups here, languages. And then we then we look back and say, but there are clusters of similarities. This whole idea that you don't get to come to the throne except by who your mother's people are. We see that a lot of places, not everywhere. Some places are patrilineal, but many are matrilineal. So, you know, Sheikh Andrew Joe writes about that. He talks about that. Ife, Ami, Ife uh, Amiadume writes a uh, book. She's uh, on, on the Igbo people. She talks about male daughters, female husbands, meaning what? The British came down and said, wait a minute, hold on. So women have control of land ownership and the descendants through the women. Yeah. OK, we don't have that. OK, so. The daughter is the, oh, who's oldest is more important? Yeah, you're but people too. Who, who's older is more important than gender. Okay, so we don't have that. So the woman inherited here, why? Not the son, why? but there was a son. Yeah, but she was older. Okay, so we don't understand. So the male didn't inherit? No. All right, so we're going to do this then. We don't have a word, a concept for that. So we're just going to call this woman a male daughter. <laughs> what? 
Okay, all right. Now, okay, so now you got a woman and man together. Yeah, the woman is, is the one in control of the land, right? Okay, she got a husband. Yeah, all right. Now, and she wants to expand the land because land don't belong to anybody. But if you got more people, more people, more children, things like that, you work more land, you have more control of the land. Okay, we get that. All right, okay. So, uh, so a man can have more than one wife, right? Yeah. And a woman can have more than one husband, huh? What? Yeah, see, in our society, see her right there? Yeah, she going to bring in another family so they get more land. Okay, how's she going to do it? Well, she going to marry this other woman who has a husband and children. And when she marries the woman, that means all their family comes into her larger family. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to call that female husbands. See... Belithia Watkins Beatty, one of the most brilliant scholars I know. We get her on the narrative side. She's going to walk y'all through how y'all should have calling yourself feminist. And womanist ain't that much of an improvement. When you're still using the model. Now, this doesn't mean these things stayed the same across time and space. They did not. This does not mean that the contemporary societies in Africa, the Caribbean, and the rest of the diaspora are not problematic. They are. This does not mean that we don't talk about women's voice and men's voice and all things. No, but it does mean that gender has to be displaced as an organizational logic when you're inheriting all the categories from somebody else and just trying to tinker with them to fool with them. No, everybody calm down. With him, he messed with him, he messed through because the echo of that attitude is still in so many Africana ways of knowing. It's still in, it's an echo. It ain't the same. The question is, can we go back into our memory and recover things that are pretty good, discard things that are bad and improve on the human condition for everybody? And the answer to that is always yes. But the fact is we have to acknowledge that it's there. And so anyway, get Ifi Yami Adume's book, Male Daughters, Female Husbands, because she's 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 making some critique of Sheikh Anta Joke, which is very necessary because Sheikh Anta Joke real hard on Europe. Matriarchy, patriarchy. He's got a whole thing called pre-colonial black Africa. And he talks about this whole thing. And he talks about the cultural unity of black Africa. That's another of the books of the great Senegalese uh, scholar, Sheikh Anta Joke, who was the older protege uh, of my teacher, of our teacher, Theophilo Benga. So at any rate, let me let me continue this now. So now. We, we draw back and look at the whole continent. And you say, man, they got a lot of different traditions. Notice I ain't saying about Harry and Meghan. We coming to y'all, though. So, in fact, let me just fast forward to them now. The British, they're going to descend into Europe and try to take over. Now, mind you, the first two powers, European powers, so to speak, that come out of Europe to colonize are the Portuguese and the Spanish. The Portuguese and the Spanish... Why are they the two? The Portuguese and the Spanish are on what they call the Iberian Peninsula. And for over seven centuries, they have been directly under the influence of the, the Arabs and the Africans under Islam. We call the Moors. The Moors brought all kind of stuff in. They translated stuff from the Greek and the Latin into Arabic and then out of Arabic into the, 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 the local languages. They brought in everything from algebra to uh, uh to the idea of bathing several times a day oh some innovations for these europeans and so and they also brought in the idea of traveling around using latitude and longitude and all this kind of stuff i mean they made improvements in other words these people knew didn't they knew the world wasn't flat when columbus by the time columbus gets out of there in the uh late 15th century when they succeed and finally you know re what they call reconquista in one one dimension of it taking back the iberian peninsula they get to use the things that have been left there over the arc of seven plus centuries take america take american history from the founding of the u.s to now triple it and you're just a little over how long the moors were in spain and portugal so please let's dispatch with the idea that this country is old and that it's even you you does anyone think america's going to be here in four or five hundred years if you do we, you know, that's that's something for the head strength for the head scientists to deal with. But at any rate, or better yet, the students of history understand. So what you then see is Spain, Portugal, France, Holland, the Dutch, very important in this. Uh, the, the English kind of get a little bit of a late start, relatively speaking, but they brutal as hell. So you see them kind of jump the line, this kind of thing. And they're all battling through bloodlines. They're battling through bloodlines. You see the uh, the Castilian crown. Ferdinand and Isabella, right? They, their marriage unifies some of the bloodlines. Uh, they're, they're, they're fomenting this notion of Christianity to fortify those bloodlines. You've got the German, well, the Franks, 
uh, now Germans would call them, you got the Gallic culture, you skip over the pond in the England, Solinguinian Islands or whatever, Caesar, you read his diary, he was like, his journal, he said, you know, these people are so stupid, they wouldn't even make good slaves, but they got to get their bloodlines going again. And so by the time you get to where we are now, you've seen a permutation of monarchies in Europe that have very little to do uh, with the monarchies outside of Europe. One thing they have in common is uh, a preference for bloodline, but here's where the bloodline thing diverges for many Africans. Now let's look at West Africa very quickly because let's look at one of the places the British came in and tried to colonize. And in fact, let's not go back before the so-called BC. Let's not even go back to a thousand uh, so-called AD, Anno Domini, near of, year of our Lord. Let's not go to the battles of Hastings in 1066. Let's not look at the so-called French, the Gallic occupation of England. Let's come forward. Let's not even go to the moment when uh, the, the, the echo of Rome, which we know as Catholicism, which has a very prominent place for the guy who can settle disputes between European powers like the Pope, who in the 15th century tell Spain and Portugal in, in, in the Treaty of Tordesillas to stop fighting. You both have the authority to reduce to servitude all infidel people. Infidel? Infidel? Christianity? Yeah! 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 Well, we, and let's not even talk about, well, so by the time they get the Tudors going and the Scots going, okay, they're going to colonize Ireland. They're going to colonize Scotland. They're going to create this United Kingdom. You got Henry VIII, who's like, want to get divorced, but I got to go through the Pope. Hell no. So they start the Anglican Church, the so-called Church of England. We ain't going to go through all that. We're going to come right to today. Because they got they, they got their monarchy going now. They've unified the crown. It's very nice. Some of y'all watch that stuff. I don't, you know. I'd rather read about the thing that happened, at least the historiography. So, because part of this is every group of humans in the world engages in with Hemi Mesu. So when you're watching this European myth making, whether it be the crown on Netflix or anything else, you're watching people creating their own jollies, their own memory keepers. Then the problem is you looking at it like there's you. You can look at it and enjoy it, but the minute you think there's you, you in left field because then you come in with a tray talking about oh, and then you happy if they switch out two of the people in the court with somebody who look like you and you think that's progress. That's purebred miseducation. So we come to the 19th century, the 1800s. The British now are in the thing thick. They in Southern Africa fighting Shaka and them. Shaka's a monarch. Shaka's monarchy is a little different though. Shaka and his mother Nandi are kind of going to come in a little bit sideways. Why? They're not like the previous manifestations. If you go back as early as the 13th century to 14th century in like the Western Sudan, Mali, uh, Ghana, Mali, then Songhai, you got Askia Muhammad because you got the Muslims in now, but you've also got bloodlines involved. You've got um, um, Sundiata. So there's all kinds of stories you can talk about in terms of descent and monarchy. Shaka is almost a political formation. The Zulu are a group that expand in part to reduce the other groups around them, smaller groups, into kind of uh, one political entity, and in part because they're resisting the British. Resistance is very important in this, but not to get too, not to get off into that. The British are now fighting in Southern Africa. They're fighting in East Africa. Read David Levering Lewis's book, The Race to Fashoda. By the time you get to the 1880s, 1890s, they're out there, they're fighting with the French in the so-called Anglo-French Sudan, uh, what we now call the Sudan, what, the Egypt, Egypt, they're fighting up there. They're, they're, they're trying to displace the Muslims back and forth. You know, this crusade thing is heavy. It's been it's still to this day, right? People talking about, you're a Muslim. <laughs> yeah, you don't even know why you mad. <laughs> you had to go back and look at European expansion. So, um, in West Africa, they're fighting the God, the Fanti, the Ashanti. They're fighting, you know, the Yoruba people. They're fighting, you know, you come up north, and, uh, they butt up against the French when you start talking about Samori Ture and them cats who are fighting against the French. Uh, 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 Amadou Bamba, the great Muslim leader and all this kind of thing. But zero in on a little spot in West Africa called the Gold Coast. And this is where, Karen, you sent me into the library. We spoke talking about the Haitian Revolution today. <laughs> On the anniversary, by the way, uh, March 13th, 1979, of the Grenadian Revolution. But we, we talk about that, too. In fact, I, I was digging around. All my Grenadian stuff is in storage except one book. And I was able to put my hands on it, but I'm not going to stop now. We'll, I just mentioned it. By the time you get to the late 19th century in the so-called Gold Coast, the Ashantis, the Fontes, and others are still fighting. Sometimes they're fighting each other. Because what has happened between the 
15th century, when the Portuguese come down there first, and the Dutch, and the late 19th century, the late 1800s, what has happened is they came and got our ancestors. The enslavement process, which peaks in the early, uh, early 19th century, really, um, which is why the Haitian Revolution is so important. The Haitian Revolution kind of throws a lot into a tailspin because them Negroes took over that damn island. It took a third of it first, then went over across into the imaginary line dividing them in the Dominican Republic, Santo Domingo, and took that too. And, and that destabilizes, because you know the British are already trying to get out the game. The so-called American Revolution, they're going to fight a civil war over enslavement there. And France is getting bank. Understand the sugar, the cotton, the coffee, the stuff that's getting financed. Haiti is the most profitable colony in the Western Hemisphere. When the Africans rob Europe, through France of Haiti, oh, this is a this is a global crisis. So the so the 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 the, the, the import of Africans from Africa really peaks right around the time of the Haitian Revolution and then begins to decline. It's over by the end of the 19th century. Brazil being formally the last one to declare enslavement uh, illegal in 1888. But around that same time, now they've come into Africa strong, and the British are in there and they fighting. They fighting the Ashantis, they fighting the Fontes, they fighting the God. Sometimes the God and the and the Akan and, 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 and uh, people, Akan is the broad language thing. They're fighting each other. And the Ashantis got weight. They heavy, they're militaristic, they know how to keep things. Kumasi, their capital, they keep it together. And they have this extensive network of rulership that we might call monarchy. As the Europeans fight, they selectively take out children and others, mostly children, younger people, of leadership to educate them. Dom Afonso of Congo, for example, sends his uh, children to Portugal to get education. It's a very good book, Toby Green's book, Fistful of Shells, which follows in a long tradition of talking about this kind of work. Very important. My man, Kwasi Kanadu. In fact, I don't know if I have any of Kwasi's books here. Uh, Kwasi Kanadu has some very good books on this subject. I would encourage you to look look at his work because it's also, he's also a publisher. He's a professor uh, in the SUNY system, but uh, he, Colgate, I think is where he is now, not Colgate, but he was in, uh, in the Cooney system for many years. Uh, Kwasi uh, has a, a press, African diasporic press, very important. Um, and I wish I could put my hands on, on the book that comes to mind now, but I won't, I won't be able to find it. But at any rate, so they, they send their children, some of them, to go edu get educated in Europe. And some of them, they educate right there on the continent. In West Africa, you begin to see the first generation of European trained Africans. But guess what? These European trained Africans also know the indigenous African ways. And so I'm going to mention this in way, by way of contrasting Harry and them and Megan with monarchy that's very different. There was there are a couple of brothers I'm going to mention. This is in, they're not the bloodline, but in terms of politics and the intellectual work, they are the precursors to, in fact, one was the mentor of uh, Kwame Nkrumah. So the other thing is the seeds for the African independence movement have already been laid while the Europeans are trying to subdue the great grandparents of the Africans who will resist. The French are fighting Samori Touré in West Africa. Well, guess what? Samori Touré's grandson, Sekou Touré, will be the one who ends up leading the independence movement in Guinea. Sekou Touré is the, the name, one of the names that Kwame Touré, formerly Stortley Carmichael out of Trinidad by way of New York Bronx High School of Science, takes as his name. The other name, Kwame, Kwame as in Kwame Ture, he takes from Kwame Nkrumah, who he considers his political father after he leaves the United States uh, and leaves SNCC in part because, if you saw Judas and the Black Messiah, counterintelligence program got a memo saying we got to pre prevent the rise of a Black Messiah. King is gone. And so we got to stop anybody from Huey Newton's on the list. Who else? Stokely Carmichael. Carmichael was like, I'm on the list. <laughs> Deuces. And so he gone. He's in West Africa. Kwame Nkrumah, he falls under the, the wing, right? And so um, these are two of the, in the genealogy that lead eventually to Kwame Nkrumah. One, the great John Mensa Sarba. Professor Hunter, you sent me back. Woo, Lord, you sent me back to the 19th century. This is from 1897. This is an original. 
Fonte customary laws, a brief introduction to the principles of the native laws and customs of the Fonte and Akan sections of the Gold Coast with a selection of cases thereon decided in the law courts. Mm -hmm. John Sarba is trained as a lawyer in the European university system, but he's an African. He said, you know what? I'm going to show you all the similarities and the difference between the law, the way Africans did it and what y'all do. The other one, the great Joseph E. Casely Hayford, Gold Coast Native Institutions with thoughts upon a healthy imperial policy for the Gold Coast and Ashanti. Casely Hayford's interesting. In fact, Gus Casely Hayford, who was the director for a hot minute of the Smithsonian uh, Museum of African, Amer African Art, and who's now in England running a museum there, is in the Casely Hayford na name line. These are famous names in Ghana. If you say Casely Hayford, oh, Casely Hayford, yes, yes. And now, now mind you, these cats ain't like Casey Hayford is not making the claim that the British should just leave Ghana. Oh, uh, what 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 becomes Ghana? The Gold Coast. Naming is important. We'll talk about that with Haiti. We can connect it to Ghana in a minute. He's saying, you know, even Du Bois. When you see Du Bois and them at the first Pan African Congress in 1919 in London, they're like, yeah, y'all got to go, but you ain't got to go without leaving the best of your traditions of institution building. Because one of the things that is not in Africa. Not in the world. It's this notion of democracy. That's why people say, you know, democracy. We should bring them. Democracy is the best form. Why y'all keep using that word? Why you keep using that word? If you knew the history of democracy, in fact, if you knew the history of Athenian so-called democracy, you might back up off that word. If you knew the history of how uh, Greece saw itself, the city states and how they had class structures and you had this elite and you had some people at the other end who were enslaved and how women didn't have no rights. And y'all was, you know, if you was enslaved and particularly if you was an African, you had one Ethiopian. In fact, uh, uh, his name is a gloss on Ethiopia. It's called Aesop. <laughs> yeah, you can be a tutor and tell them animal stories and stuff. But I'm saying, like, why do y'all keep wanting to use that word democracy? I guess it's a shorthand for people ruled by the people of the people. Okay, how that work when you got millions of people? Somebody got to give some orders. So what Mensa Sarba does and what J.E. Casey Hayford does, do, they walk through kingship, for example. Watch this. This is from page 44 of Gold Coast Native Institutions. It's called Native Institutions 2B, the King's Paramountcy. He says, this is uh, J.E. Casey Hayford. Casey Hay, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, John Mrs. Sarber's book was 1897. J.E. Casey Havers is 1903. 1903. I claim you're the souls of black folk. See, the problem is we get caught up in America as black Americans, those of us who are black Americans, and we start shrinking our entire ability to think about human possibility in them narrow little, narrow little places called American history. And, you know, I love James Weldon Johnson. And James Rosemont Johnson, I think Lift Every Voice and Sing is a beautiful anthem. But as I tell my students at Howard often, sometimes I just get in the mood. I'll come in, play this song. Y'all heard of Bobby Blue Bland, right? <laughs> I say this should be the Black National Anthem. You, you heard of Bobby Blue Bland, uh, Professor Hunter? I the have. I the, have. The great Bobby Blue Bland. Bobby Blue Bland said, I pity the fool. <laughs> oh, 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 I pity the fool, I pity the fool that falls in love with you and expects you to be true. Oh, I pity the fool. Bobby Blue Bland. See, I'm saying that should be the Black National Anthem. Negro fell in love with America. Look at the people. <laughs> Bobby Blue Bland said, I know you wonder what they're doing. They just standing there watching you make a fool of me. Oh, I pity the fool. <laughs> he said, she'll break your heart one day and then she'll laugh and walk away. Oh, I pity the fool. <laughs> Y'all keep loving America. You keep loving the idea. I'm not saying we shouldn't all fight for a better society. Hell, we got to do that. But I pity the fool they fall in love with that place, with this place, and expect it to be true. Because that means you don't, you just look at the history and say, I refuse to believe it. Look, <laughs> look at the people. I mean, look at the world. I mean, look, look at the people. I know you wonder what they're doing. They just standing there watching you make a fool of me. Y'all looking at jury selection, ain't you? 
mm. and Minneapolis St. Paul thinking justice. Y'all think $27 million get paid to George Floyd's family out of taxpayer money, which means you paid to? <laughs> That's just, I pity the fool. <laughs> Look at the people. I know you wondering what they're doing. They're just standing there watching you make a fool of me. Anyway, so J.E. Casey Hayford says, to the students of jurisprudence, fresh from the law schools of Great Britain, the doctrines of paramountancy and the customary law must be bewildering and difficult of comprehension. Paramountancy means who is the paramount chief? In other words, what they may call in the Ashanti, uh, the, the top, ruler is the Asantahini. Now, he says, so to somebody who went to law school in England, where they got a king and queen, it might be a uh, kind of odd. He says, hence it is that there is so much haziness of view upon the subject. The principles involved are of supreme importance alike to the administrator and to the occupant of the judicial bench. A mistake here may involve hardships to which the European mind may seem trifling, but which to the Aborigines may affect the very core of native institutions. Then he asked the question, now, what are the rights of the king in respect of the lands of a community? The king, qua king, does not own all the lands of the state. The limits of his proprietary rights are strictly defined. There are, first of all, lands which are the ancestral property of the king. Then he goes on. And then he starts talking about cases. Here's the here's the here's the gist of it. I want to give you the gist of it because this is fascinating. I, I encourage you all. Um, in fact, hold up. Let me go to page 43 at the end of the next. Uh, he's got a whole chapter called the king. He says the king is also. As we have seen, the first magistrate of his people. In the native state system, the people have not yet arrived at the stage where the king is merely the fountain of justice and appoints officers to dispense it merely in his name. He himself presides over the hearing of all important cases supported by his principal chiefs, counselors, and linguists. There are also other important chiefs in a state who are empowered to decide cases, but the courts of such chiefs are subsidiary to the king's court and not independent of it. Uh, this is a big book. The thesis is this. People don't do what the king says because the king said it. No, it doesn't work that way. If the king goes crazy, if the king gets out of line, the people bring the king up to decide whether the king can continue as king. Now, does the king come through bloodline? Absolutely. However, oh my God, I wish I had time to go through this. But I'm gonna in fact let me just let me let me let me describe let me describe it in terms of a conversation that uh I was having with a guy, an economist, white economist who spent a lot of time in West Africa and the Caribbean. And he said, you know, I was in Nigeria back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. And at the time, there was a lot of conversation, a lot of Marxist historians and Marxist economists around it, debating the ideological positions. Thing they did. And I remember a conversation that I was part of and, and listening to where they got into this whole conversation of the nature of rulership. And they said, you know, one of the problems with the president or prime minister model in Africa, and there's a lot of stuff that kind of echoes this. I mean, Basil Davidson many years ago wrote a book called uh, the, the Africa and the Curse of the Nation State, the White Man's Burden. I mean, it's all kind of things. But he says, you know, when you say president or prime minister, this is not a, a, a position that existed prior to European invasion. So there's no system to absorb it in a way that can be correlative to the systems that existed before. That's why Hazley Hayford is writing this book, Gold Coast Native Institutions. He's saying, y'all coming in here with this stuff, and he says this a little bit later. But Hazley Hayford is like, yeah, and some of the things you bring in are improvements, because right? he's he's a man in both worlds. You see the schizophrenia at work. But he's also saying, don't throw this away. Let me tell you what we do. And so the guy was telling me, he said, you know, so they expect that a president or a prime minister can be a dictator. Because then nobody know who his mama is. There's no check or balance. He got the army. He said, well, if you say king, and this was the argument debate they were having. They were saying, maybe we should not have gotten rid of the, the king model, the queen model. Why? Because when you say king or queen, that person if you look at the Ashanti, for example, and a lot of the Akan people, it's going to come through who your mother is. That's number one. If you trifling, 
you don't get to be the ruler because there are competing claims. And if you're in there and start doing things like try to get into business, because the region, the place you're over, has its own chiefs and queen mothers, every little place. I remember when we were in Ghana in 1996 at the uh, Ghanaian Senate building. We had the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations meeting there. And our job, myself, uh, uh, Valethea Watkins, Mario Beatty, we were together. We were selling grad school at the time. Dr. Obenga was there. Our job was to have a two-day dialogue with teenagers. There was a maybe about 30 young people who had come from the U.S., almost all of them from Crenshaw High School in L.A. And there were an equal number of students who had come from some of the high schools there in Accra, the capital city of Ghana. And for two days, two days, Karen, two days, we sat with those teenagers and talked about everything we could think of in terms of not only African history and culture, but their lived experiences. We led with those. The first day we were there, before we split up, we had the grand assembly and then we went into the different, and we were there with them. The students from the United States came in their best African clothes. And then they said, we want the students from the US to stand up. They all stood up, they're very proud. The sisters had their dresses on, brothers had their dashikis, and they was very nice. They said, and we want now to join them, the students from here, our hosts. Every last one of those young people from Ghana stood up, shirts and ties and dresses. And before we broke, I said, hold on a second. I want y'all to look at each other. You dressed in a way that you thought would impress your cousin. <laughs> Here's how you see this is what colonialism has done to us. The Africans got on the Western dress and the Africans from the diaspora got on the African dress. We're gonna have a conversation about values in about 10 minutes. And then we went to the room. <laughs> because underneath that was, fam, I'm gonna impress you, fam. But the surface was, it's filtered through whatever we've been educated for, right? So even on the, on the continent, especially the devaluation and in the diaspora, the made up imagination of what Africa is. I mean, so it's all there. I mean, this is not a right or wrong thing, right? We get in there, and the first thing I start after we, after we, everybody introduce themselves, we have conversations. I said, you know what? I'm gonna show y'all something. This is my first time in Ghana. I said, uh, y'all had the CD here, and y'all know now the cowrie shells, people wear them, this kind of thing. CD was one of form. A CD is a is is a word that we would maybe it's a word close in in, in tree to cowrie, so cowrie shells, right? On the money, you have pictures of Africans. And you got, you know, you know, you, you, you've got the idea that we can see ourselves on the money. So I said to them, I said, now I'm gonna show y'all something. So I reached my pocket, put out a one dollar bill, George Washington. I said, You see this here? This is one dollar. And I forget how many CDs it was in 1996 at the time, but I said, This is valuable. Then I took it, ripped it, ripped it a couple of times, ripped it some more, turned it into confetti, let it fall. Them African students almost lost their damn mind. <laughs> what? Everybody calm down. I said, when I leave here, when we leave and go back to the United States in a couple of weeks, I'm going to take one denomination of the money here back to where I'm from, Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm going to get to my mother. My mother very may well put that in a frame and put it on the wall because got your face on it. Won't y'all understand something about the nature of value? Mm. And they, but this is it, Karen, this is the thing. So we were there for, and this ain't even where I'm going with Queen Mothers, I could come to that. After we broke for lunch, one of the boys came. The smallest denomination they had in Ghanaian money was a little coin a five CD, uh, five CD coin. Looked like almost like a, a, a half dollar in U.S. money. And it has a picture of a cowrie shell on it. Now, at that time, they would say five CDs, you can't even buy water. It, they don't even, they say that's not even water money. So you, anybody have five CDs, right? This, this, this kid, maybe 15 years old, this young man walked up to me and said, but a car. I said, yes, sir. He went in his pocket, Karen, pulled out a five CD coin with a cowrie shell on it, held my hand palm up, put that coin in my palm, 
closed my fingers and said, give that to your mother for me. I pity the fool that fall in love with you and expect you to be true. I didn't even, I mean, that boy, I mean, he said, get to your mother for me. Anyway, so the second day we were there, we're going to win because we're human in the world. And one thing we never let y'all do is take our humanity. Y'all think that you have a country because uh, we couldn't fight. Now, you have a country because of our kindness. As Langston Hughes said, oh, look at the Negro, meek and, uh, what is it? Look at the Negro, meek and kind. Beware the day we change our mind. So at any rate, and that day is coming. Trust, y'all keep passing these damn voter suppression laws. Y'all let Derek Chauvin go. You got about no more times, bruh. Anyway, so day two, about midway through, we back from lunch. We've been in there intense. I'm telling you, these young people bonded. Oh, my God. About midway through, who walks in? Leonard Jeffries and Rosalind Jeffries. Dr. Leonard and Rosalind Jeffries, Newark's finest. They said, we just came in to check on you, but there's some people who wanted to come in and see what this conversation is about. They open the door. And we in, we in a room where everybody can sit in like staggers, like a classroom. It was beautiful, the Ghanaian Senate building. The, the building, I mean, the, the room probably held maybe 60. So, I mean, not 60, maybe 100. So we had about maybe 60, 75 people in there. People coming in and out. Professor Hunter, the Jeffries, Dr. Leonard and Doc, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries said, there's some people want to see what y'all are talking about. Who did they bring in? It's about a dozen. The Paramount Chiefs and the Queen Mothers of the region. These elders walked in, Kente, Gold, every one of the Ghanaian students stood up like somebody had shot them. And about a split second later, all the students from the diaspora stood up. The protocol, the elders have come in. They sat, everybody, you could hear a pin drop. One of the queen mothers was like, no, no, continue, please. Sat down. They said, we can't continue, Nana, until we had a proper protocol. Forgive us. We've been away for a couple of centuries. What is the protocol? Jeffrey's like, well, we asked them if they want, and they and the queen mother, one of the chiefs, gave a little few remarks, and then we continued. And then we asked them if they had any thoughts. Of, See, this is the governance structure. Who are we to each other? Those young people from Crenshaw High School know old people come in, you're supposed to stand up. But but it's, it was a half beat off because that's not the protocol we observe here. Even though you may be cousin up a storm, but old lady passed by, you get quiet. No, we still know some rules. A child cussing her mom out in the, uh, in the mall, black people looking at each other like, why? Because the echo of the rules are still there. You don't talk to you don't talk to old people like you crazy. So at any rate, what Casey Hayford and Simp Sarber talk about here in both these books, they said that when you are a king, first of all, it's picked by who the woman who's 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 your mother. And if you're acting crazy, then the people tell the Queen Mothers of Paramount Chiefs, they get together, they communicate, they convene the council, and then they decide whether or not you can continue as the king. Why? Because, you know, the principal purpose of a king, this is what the economist was talking to, he, I'll sum that up, he said, maybe we should have kept the king model. Why? He says, because, you know, the principal purpose of a monarch is to settle disputes, land disputes, whose stuff is this, this kind of thing. And, and that's what, both Sarba and Casey Haber, and these are just two out of thousands of books, thousands of conversations. The reason I picked these two is because these were written by two bridge figures, continental Africans born and raised in the system who were then trained outside by the Europeans who can give you a comparative analysis from 1897 and 1903. Now there's been, like people say, well, there much better stuff's been written since. Absolutely, far superior, also inferior. Why? You wasn't there. This is what the Yoruba would call first person. Oto, you got first person. Then you got Bakbo, second person. Second person is us talking about the books. First person is the two that wrote the book. And he said, and so what they say is secondhand knowledge is everything that you didn't experience directly. So this is firsthand knowledge. 
And it, whether it's got gaps or flaws and it all will, of course, it's still extremely valuable. And so when I look at William, when I look at Elizabeth, when I look at Harry, when I look at all them, I'm looking at a European system to say you can be crazy as hell. But if, the, if your mama is the queen, you the king. The Africans would be looking like, yeah, but he crazy. <laughs> well, we can't do anything about it. It's bloodline. Yo, man, what the hell is wrong with these white people? If the cat is crazy, you call the council together. I'm sorry, but y'all coming down here telling us about democracy. What? What is democracy? Look, we got a king. Yes. And that's bad. Yeah. But do you understand? I mean, oh, Karen, I wish we had the time. If you read John Mensa Sarba. Oh, in fact, let me just fast forward to uh, to Frederick Douglass for a second. <laughs> we, we, may not, we may not get to Haiti cold today, but and we, we that's all right. We will. Um, this is what Frederick Douglass said. Frederick Douglass gave a talk in 1893. Let me just pause here so I can reset to make sure I connect all this very quickly. I'm not going to do much more than this on this. Frederick Douglass was appointed minister to Haiti. I think 1889. He followed the first diplomat who was appointed, who was the brother we talked about last week, who was the principal of the Institute for Colored Youth when Octavius Cato was still alive. Douglas was appointed as the minister to Haiti, but Douglas's appointment, his authority was often undermined and superseded by the United States military who had boats in the harbor right off the coast of Haiti. In the World's Exposition of 1893, when they would not give the World's Fair of 1893 in Chicago, we talked about January 2nd, 1893, when they wouldn't give black people in the United States a place to talk about the achievements of black Americans in the World's Fair, but the Haitians had a pavilion and the Haitians gave the African people here, Ida B. Wells and them and Fred Douglas and I Garland Penn a place. And they wrote that uh, the world's exposition, why the Negro is not in the, in the world's exposition. In the lecture on Haiti, he gives, Douglas gives a talk on Haiti, January the 2nd, 1893. He says, he says the argument as stated against Haiti is that since her freedom, she has become lazy, that she is given to gross, gross idolatry and that these evils are on the increase, that voodooism, fetishism, serpent worship and cannibalism are prevalent there, that little children are fatted for slaughter and offered as sacrifices to their voodoo deities, that large boys and girls run naked through the streets of the towns and cities and that things are generally going from bad to worse. He's saying this is what y'all saying about Haiti. He said, meaning white people. He said, and many miseducated Negroes to this day. Um, Douglas says, in reply to these dark and damning allegations, it will be sufficient only to make a general statement. I admit at once that there is much ignorance and much superstition in Haiti. This is the miseducation of the American Negro, including uh, Frederick Douglass. This is, we got to talk about Haiti in great detail because Haiti is the country that becomes a microcosm for black possibility in the modern world. In other words, it is where Africa met and it is where a met Africa threw off the shackles of white supremacy. And then since then has tried to figure out what the hell it even means to have a black place that we govern. So if you want to think about the possibilities of black life in the modern world, particularly in the diaspora, Haiti is probably the best single place. If you must have a single place to start the conversation because it is hella complicated. It is grounded in that reblended, smashed through Africa. It is often held together by its fierce determination to be free. And at the same time, what does it mean to create something that never was created out of something that was smashed together out of circumstances, but that because of the strength of the thing that was smashed together, allowed it to throw off the oppression. It is powerful. But at any rate, so Douglas is like, uh, you know, he, you know, I admit this stuff. He's admitting it in part because he's estranged himself from the Africana cultural echoes. He says the common people there do believe much in divinations, charms, witchcraft, putting spells on each other and in the supernatural and miracle working power of their voodoo priests generally. Owing to this, there's a feeling of superstition and dread of each other, the destructive tendency of which cannot be exaggerated. But it is amazing how much of such dark darkness, again, is flaw. Society has borne and can bear and is bearing without falling to pieces and without being hopelessly abandoned to barbarism. Some people, myself included, will argue that's what's saving them, not the thing that you say is not saving them. That's the strength. But here's where I'm going. Douglas said, let it be remembered. This is me. For me, this is where Douglas is at his best. 
He says, let it be remembered that superstition and idolatry in one form or another have been have not been in the past, nor are they in the present confined to any particular place or locality. And that even in our enlightened age, we need not travel far from our own country, from England, from Scotland, from Ireland, France, Germany or Spain to find considerable traces of gross superstition. We consult familiar spirits in America. Queen Victoria gets water from the Jordan to christen her children as if the water of that river were any better than the water of any other river. Many go thousands of miles in this age of light to see an, uh, an old seamless coat supposed to have some divine virtue. Christians at Rome kiss the great toe of a black image called St. Peter and go upstairs on their knees to gain divine favor. Here we build houses and then God and, and then God's houses and go into them to meet God as if the Almighty dwelt in temples made with men's hands. I am not myself together altogether free from superstition. Then he goes on. Point is this. Why y'all worshiping Harry? You know what that interview was? That interview ain't nothing to do with Megan. It ain't nothing to do with Oprah. That interview had everything to do with people who have been trained to worship something that had nothing to do with them. Because the prize of the whole enterprise is Harry and the bloodline. And you heard what happened when Oprah asked him, did you want to give it up? No. Would you? Have yeah. Yeah. And so I don't, I don't you know, listen, <laughs> racism is hell of a thing. Nobody should suffer it. I don't have an opinion on Meghan Markle. I do not know her. I know one thing. Y'all going to stop being racist to black people. But let's be clear. All that is secondary to the primary problem. The primary problem is worshiping something because it has been forced onto you and into your mind. And you don't even know that's the main issue. It has, it, everything else is secondary to the issue that you worshiping something and even Harry, trapped by bloodline. Oh, he gave it up. The dude is still rich. What y'all met? Oh, yeah. Oh, y'all want to go. Don't say you don't want to go because y'all be watching the hell out of Bridgerton. Don't say you want to go. Why? Because you know you watch Zamunda and made a black version of uh the white king. And guess what? Just because you the daughter of the king or you was living in Queens and Eddie Murphy came and got you and brought you back to Zamunda. If you know the history of monarchy in many places in Africa, that don't mean you get to be the ruler. I'm going to pause there for a minute because we can. <laughs> uh, OK, yeah, I, I, I'm looking at the time. Yeah, maybe we do Haiti in narrative extensively because that's the place that we're going to do it. And. Or, or maybe we'll do it next week um, because Haiti's still going through their thing, you know. Haiti is, Haiti is so out. so important. In fact, yeah, maybe we will because I know we won't we won't talk much about it now. I do want to mention though that Haiti for me, um, shout out to all my uh, Philadelphia Freedom Schools young people. Uh, twelve, no, more than twelve years ago, maybe 13, 14 years ago, we did a summer. No, it was about twelve years ago. We read Randall Robinson's book, An Unbroken Agony, uh, on Haiti. He had published it in 2007, and uh, Brother Robinson came and spent a uh, part of the summer with us, spent a time with us. We were at University of Maryland Eastern Shore for our training. Um, I, Kelly Sparrow, um, all the folks who were involved in Philip Freedom School at the time, but I usually had the responsibility and the great responsibility in terms of, in terms of one of the great responsibilities I've had great pleasure to do in my life. Of picking the book that we we read, so I said this summer, let's let's talk about Haiti. We need to really deal with Haiti, and so you know it's a complicated piece, and and I think it's very important because that summer that I went and got all kind of resource books. I probably got a couple, about about a dozen of them sitting here that aren't in storage. Um, I went to New York to um, the. Uh, this is a very good book. In fact, I would suggest to people, the International Action Center. I went up to Brooklyn. This is the updated version. I got the other version over here. It's called Haiti, a Slave Revolution, 200 Years After 1804. It was published in 2004 for the 200th anniversary. Um, this was the same year that Ron Daniels uh, led a group, the Haiti Support Project, to Haiti. Um, then after the earthquake in 2010, my man Wade Nobles went down. These are two books I would very much recommend. Wade Nobles wrote a book called The Island of Memes, Haiti's Unfinished Revolution, which is very important on the subject. Uh, following Wait, what, hey, meme, we think of meme as a as a thing that we use picture now on like social media. Yeah, and that's what he's saying. He's saying 
what you see in Haiti are all the memes, the memes of stereotype about black people and the memes black people create to fortify themselves and creating new government, new governance. So when we say for us, young people say, oh, we're doing this for the culture. What is the culture? The culture is a convening of memes, of shorthands. You're not really, if you had to explain it, you couldn't really, well, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a gif or it's a phrase or yeah, see, see, it's a meme. And so he says, Haiti is an island of memes. He said, you got to understand how when they had that voice came on a uh, ritual on uh, August the 14th, 18, I'm uh, sorry, 1791, that jumps off the so-called revolution. It's a festival of, of Ogun ritual. When you hear Book My Daddy say, cast down the image of the white man's God who has brought down your tears for so long and listen to liberty, which lives in all our hearts. And the mambo is sitting there, the sister who's presiding over the ritual, Cecile Fatima, who is there. I mean, they are creating out of a blended construct of Congo and Yoruba and Igbo and all these different groups. They're, they're creating a, a foundation for resistance. But a foundation for resistance, what um a brother who just, um, Neil Roberts wrote this book very good called Freedom as Marinage. He talks about this idea of uh, sovereign marinage. Haiti is not petite marinage. It's not you, it's not, you know, Karen saying, I'm gonna leave the plantation tonight. I'll be back by sunrise. But uh, me and Greg and, you know, a few other people, you know, uh, I'm gonna get, we, we gonna sit around the fire and tell stories and I'll be back for this. That's petite marinage. I ran away long enough to be human. I'll be back before they know I'm gone. Grand marinage might mean there's a maroon village, a few left, and then we just left and never came back. What Roberts is like, yeah, but Haiti, that's sovereign marinage. In other words, they got a whole damn country. Do you understand that Napoleon sent his brother-in-law Leclerc over there and they, he said, this shit right here, <laughs> we can't let this go. Not only did you just rob us of half our damn economy, if we let you go, every Negro in the Western Hemisphere is going to turn up. And sure enough, you hear people all of a sudden in Boston, in New Orleans, in Charleston, you hear people, hell, uh, what's my man? Uh, Simon Bolivar comes to Haiti and pets you on them like, look, we're going to give you some money and stuff, bro. What you trying to do? Shit, I'm trying to try this turn up in Venezuela. Okay, they call themselves the Avengers of the New World. You can't mm -hmm. let that, but they're not, but they haven't built a society because they don't have a blueprint for a society. So, th so, so what's the homework? So let's give some homework for yeah, next week. We should, because as we start talking about the monarchy, you know, I just wanted people to understand that we, you know, our notion of kingdom uh, is vastly different than what we've been conditioned That's to right. believe. And so that was important. But next week, this is about world building. When you talk about Avengers, you know, that just got my spidey senses, literally. <laughs> spidey yes. Senses all tingly because, you know, we're in, we're in this place you call the inflection point in history yes. right now yes so we are going to be tasked with building a new world yes. it is our responsibility to do yes. that what we're doing here on saturday is a shade of it but if people are going to do homework to prepare for next week's conversation okay are those good. the books that they should be reading um i would say a very good book let me just give you a couple um so you can get them between now and then one very good book well very quickly, there are two categories that you, we can think about Haiti in. One, Haiti as Haiti inside. And there's all kind of stuff. We know the name Toussaint Louverture. Many people, for example, might not know that Toussaint, um, you know, initially was like, look, we can't close these plantations. So we got to keep that going. And then, of course, they trick him. He ends up dying in, 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 in France. And then after him comes Jean-Jacques Dessalines. Dessalines is the one that says we're going to rip the white out the middle of the Haitian flag. Uh, Catherine Elan, the mother of the Haitian flag, which is why Flag Day in Haiti is still celebrated. They create the Haitian flag. There's, there's colorism, class tensions, because after he is killed, Dessalines is killed. And I'll just mention, for those of you who are in fine arts, there are a couple of actually, oh, come on, son. Oh, yeah, I got him. Here goes a couple right here. The great uh, Amy Césaire. Well, Amy says, wait, I'll do, the, I'll do this one first. This brother just made transition. Douglas Turner Ward. He, these are three plays that he labored and created and finished. There he is right there on the back. The great Douglas Turner Ward, uh, the American Negro Ensemble Theater. The Haitian Chronicles. Uh, before that, and I'll end, with, I'll end in a second with the book that I think that will connect in terms of playwrights this together. Uh, after that, the, the, you see the third, the third of the plays is Dessaline. 
Dessaline comes after Toussaint, as we know. Dessaline is killed, killed in the street. Then you see, and all, all these cats, uh, Dessaline follows Toussaint because he was the next ranking in the military. Dessaline's second in command then takes over Henri Christophe. This is Amy Césaire's uh, play, The Tragedy of King Christophe. Christophe decides to make himself the king. Again, thinking about this question of my, what would it mean to people who are used to a certain form of governance? It's a fascinating thing. We won't get into it today in terms of homework. This you said, you said homework. So the one category is what is the internal dynamic of Haiti? Which is why I think for, for that, there's been there are many, 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 many books on it. But hmm. to get a book quickly written in English, the book that kind of laid the foundation in many ways for what some people call Haitian studies is a cat from Trinidad, ironically. Cyril Lionel Robert James, The Black Jacobins. Toussaint Louverture and the San Domingo Revolution. This is a dated book. In fact, this is the second edition. Uh, is, it, is it a public domain? It should be, yeah, because this, right. this is a book that's kind of everywhere. You should be able to find it. That's why I said, get the that book. Man, um, um, all right. Yeah, that, that book. And then um, the other category quickly is how people outside of Haiti look at Haiti. And I'm thinking now about Black people. That's what Douglas is talking about. That's what uh, Baba Wade is talking about, my friend Wade Nobles. And this is a book that was uh, published in 1985. Another book by the Jegna, the great Jacob Carruthers, The Irritated Genie, an essay on the Haitian Revolution. Like C.L.R. James, who is not from Haiti, the idea is there is a Haiti as it exists. And we're going to talk a lot about that. We'll get everything. Aristide, we'll talk about the, the, the U.S. military occupation, 1915, 1935. We'll talk about the last half of the 19th century where you see some incredible intellectuals. But there's a there's a class divide between everybody who lives in Haiti, who is mostly rural, and the people in Port-au-Prince, you know, the people who are living in the cities and that, that tiny elite that's grifting, basically. So we'll talk about all that. There's the internal, but the external of Haiti. Grifting, grifting and bolstered by America. Oh, and oh, 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 and we're gonna get into all that, no question. And then, and then, we'll, but then we'll talk about the reason why, for example, I got the full size Haitian flag in my house. You, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You because see, the hold, it again, hold it up again. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. In unity, there is strength. <laughs> Haiti, no question. Desaline said, now nah, we ripping this out. You see that blue and that white, red, that's coming together. Some people say that's because that's the colors of Ogun. Some scholars say he was trying to bridge the gap between the uh, the black folk who got free after independence and the so-called mulattoes and mixed race who were free before independence, who never trusted him. But then you had the generals who were in the army. And so there's the tension is always there. But that elite, those t all that stuff for Africans who are outside of Haiti, Haiti is the Avengers of the New World. So mm -hmm. the complexity of Haitian politics often bemuses, which is why we spent a whole summer doing it with these high school students, some of whom come from Haiti. Uh, we, we, we said because to, in order to understand Haiti as it is, we can't just understand Haiti as it is without understanding Haiti as it exists in the black imagination. And we can't understand how Haiti exists in the black imagination without understanding Haiti as it is. Because without either of those halves, it'll just confuse you to have one of the halves. And, and so I'll never forget uh, the Battle of Verteries, which is, uh, um, that was um, the 214th anniversary of the battle. Verteries, which took place uh, in Haiti 214 years ago, back in, in 2017, uh, I actually went to the Haitian embassy here in DC, uh, the Howard University Alumni Association and all the Haitians uh, who were in it and others, uh, um, Martin Ely, my, my friends, they asked me to come and, and give a few words on that battle at the Haitian embassy. And I said, this is a great honor an African in the diaspora. So of course I learned enough Creole to give the greeting in Creole and talk about, you know, the, 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 the battle. And, you know, it's like, wow, this is great, man. This is wonderful. I'm, I'm looking at the pictures on the walls. I'm looking at the, you know, Haitian Americans. And that's the same president that they telling now, you got to go, man. Mm -hmm. You got to go. And I'm saying, but that's the complexity of black life in the diaspora. Those are the tensions, you know, those, I mean, so anyway, I just, you know, but we'll, we'll talk more about, yeah, next week we can do the deep dive. And then we, on the narrative side, then we get it really, cause I'm not an expert on Haitian studies. 
that's not my area. I'm in Africana studies and I take that very seriously. But I know enough to know how to make connections and then get out of the way. And that's all the work we're doing. Let's be clear on. Clear. Speaking yeah. of that, <laughs> the brother that designed that shirt and people right. on it uh, is Uraeus. He's also one of the chief architects. Let me thank the whole team. Let me thank Kareem, of course, Donica, uh, uh, Carl, of course, and Uraeus, because uh, we're going to be talking about how we can get the Black Jacobins in narrative before uh, next week as well. So oh, that, yes, uh, yes. You know, because he's been over the last week, we've been playing around with different programs to make sure that their books in their, you know, Souls of Black Folk and other you know, uh, public domain works that we've talked about. And yeah. he also designed a shirt, but I want him to come in today before we get to Dr. Elizabeth and her question uh, to tell you what's new, because he's got such a please, nice voice. Please, come so on, brother, please. Today before we get to Dr. Elizabeth. All right, there's a, there's a, uh, a reverb. All right, can you hear me, Uraeus? Talk. I can, hear you fine. Fine. can you guys okay. hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. Well, uh, honor and a pleasure to uh, join you. And just uh, you know, feeding off the uh, the inspiration from uh, you know the the uh, the in class fam, and just uh, uh, really excited, and just kind of wanted to share with the uh, the fam while everybody's gathered what we have cooking over on the narrative side. Yes. Which yeah, one of the, um, the 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 beautiful things that we have, and for some of you guys who've already been on the site, is the narrative archives. And uh, Dr. Carr, you were talking about uh, first person resources. You know, we know of uh, Kwame Torre or uh, Dr. John Henry Clark. We've read them. We've heard of them. But have you heard them? Have you heard them speak? Have you heard Marcus Garvey uh, give a speech at uh, Madison Square Garden, 1920s? Have you heard uh, Mary McLeod Bethune speak uh, or uh, Lorraine Hansberry? And with this archives, we're giving people the opportunity. We're curating uh, resources and information, first person resources from across the web. Uh, we want you to have information at your fingertips and you'll have the opportunity to uh, hear these people speak, whether it's uh, Nelson Mandela, Della, Winnie Mandela, uh, Garvey, King, uh, Dr. J uh, George Washington Carver. So uh, we're starting out with 25 ancestors and wow. we're giving you a, uh, a wealth of first person resources so you can hear uh, hear from their mouths, you know, what yeah. they believe, their, their struggles, their their triumphs, what they went through. So giving you first person resources. Uh, this The most important part of this thing to me is that this uh, narrative is a genius magnet. And what we're oh, trying man. to do, our, our mission <laughs> statement is that, that we're trying to pull uh, j just geniuses. As we know, in the black community, there's genius on every street corner. No question. Our, our mission and our vision is to pull all that genius in uh, to one platform and into one family environment to cultivate that genius and just to redistribute it throughout the community. Yes. So that, that's narrative. Yeah. So uh, we, we're giving you the narrative archives, which is 25 ancestors from the jump that you guys will um, uh, be able to listen to, sit at the feet of, so to speak. And it's a living site, it's a living zone. So we'll continue to grow, we'll continue to drop ancestors as we find more and more resources. Absolutely. But that's uh, you know, one of the most it, well, exciting things to me is just seeing how people respond and the response has been overwhelming so far. Yes, yes, yeah, oh man, Reyes, man, that's uh, so you bringing folks in. Oh wait, can you? I was gonna say, you know, yes. resources come when we sign up. We are creating the world that we wanna live in. And that's right the film and the documentaries and the things that need to get done, you know, we can only do it because we're not going outsource, you know, going out to get, uh, we're not uh, going out to get money from anybody. This right. is us doing it. And so I'm grateful to everyone who signed up. Uh, we got rid of all of the code. So you just go to narrative.com, you know, ah. the code. Um, and this is just through April, $99 through April. I mean, through yes. March and April, that's going to go up. Uh, and this is kind of our beta. We're, we're kicking the tires, making sure everything functions well. We're we're adding things. The book the bookstore is expanding. The bibliography section is expanding, um, and I'm just I'm excited. I'm grateful that we have the team that we have, including you, Dr. Carr. Uh, no, you no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 if I can say one more thing, I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline. You know, if you if you guys are are excited about the uh, the annotated in class discussions where we give you the hot links. You know, Dr. Carr mentions a song or sings a song. The song's gonna pop up. He mentions a historical <laughs> figure. The image is gonna pop up. It's gonna take you to um, you know, information is gonna be at your fingertips. It's gonna take you down a rabbit hole. We want your research to be as efficient uh, and as easy as possible. But wait until you see these uh, digital books that we're gonna drop on this narrative bookshelf. Yeah, it's gonna be flippable in your iPad and it's gonna have the same annotation. There are gonna be videos in the books. Uh, links to song and songs in the books, uh, music, and and just hot links, rabbit holes. So that's uh, coming next. So we're really excited about that. And it's lit. And it's living. Uh, you race. I mean, exactly. continue to. That's the thing that I think. Um, 
for folks who are watching who you know as we started it's very organic it's just conversational like we had these conversations and every after every saturday i think about so many more things that we could have talked about and i was watching something the other day and it just triggered another memory one of the things i'm, I'm i won't get into that since we're having this conversation um so on the narrative side as like i said i've already done all this work to annotate to kind of you know put everything there that's a point of entry so even like today the stuff on meta nature and language that's just a, a point of entry so what you'll see is uh as we continue there will be much 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 more than even the initial round of annotation than the initial round and in, in other words uh, so if I mentioned the dynasties and the intermediate periods in, in classical Africa, I mean, I mentioned Theophilo Bingo, you know, all those things are there. But uh, Jan Osman, there are at least five books that I didn't mention. It's OK. I need, now these need to come in. And then there are other sources and resources that have to be added to that. I mean, the whole to flesh out all of that stuff requires this a lot a more. For all of us working on it, it's a life mission. It's a crowdsource, right? It's a crowd. We all, we all are saying this is the thing that we want to do with our lives. So, yes. uh, yes. and that's that's what makes this so special that we have all these educators involved in making this thing happen. So, yes, I want to say yes. thank you, Uraeus. And every week we're gonna be dropping something new. So, uh, right. we're in the lab, as Uraeus would say. We're in the lab. I got this new thing. Okay, let's put it in. No so, question. I just want to thank. Thank him publicly. Uh, the work is, woo, it's Thank a you. lot, but um, we're ready for it. Yes. Built, yes. built for it, born for it. Yes, we yes. are. No question. All this right. is the thing. <laughs> Thank you, Reyes. Let's, you, let's bring in Dr. Elizabeth, uh, who has her question. She's from uh, Los Angeles. Hey. Welcome to In Class. Hey, Doc. Can she hear us? She's unmuted now. Uh oh, muted back. Unmuted, muted, unmuted, unmuted. She's back. Oh, she's well, coming back. She's, she'll be back. She'll be back. Hello. All right, there she is. All right. How are you, sis? Can you, I'm here. How are you? I'm fine. How you doing? I'm fine. <laughs> um, I am a, I was just at um, uh, the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. In coach, yeah. And I go every year. Yes. And I present there every year. And Dr. Lester Spence, he's at John Hopkins. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know the brother. No and brother. he came up with this. So he has this, I, uh, he's working on this project that really incited something that I'm working on called trying to look through, move emancipation notion out of the way and look towards manumission. Interesting. Instead of we experience. Right. And so interesting. It makes That's me interesting. think about um, because I am a, 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 a part time adjunct instructor at like so many colleges in California. I don't Got to make it making it work. Yes. 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 <laughs> right. Yes. Where, where are you working? Well, I'm a lecturer at CSUN, Cal State Northridge, but yeah. I am. Oh, Northridge. Part -time. Cal State Northridge. Yeah, and then, okay. but I'm a part-time instructor at in the community college system at Compton College and El Camino. Oh, Camino. wow. A few of them. Okay. Well, those are my people. That's where we're at ASCAP. We had the first co conference. In fact, we were out there. I was at Cal State Northridge when the big earthquake hit back in the night. Tony Martin was speaking about Marcus Garvey. It was a Sunday morning. I'll never forget. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, you you were, you were the folks who really want to learn. Yeah, no question. <laughs> um. Well, here's the thing, is that I am trying to, st I, I, would, I presented on a paper and it was called Ready for War. And because there is a brewing issue that's taking place for Blacks being discriminated against and not getting full-time positions in the community college system. And actually there's a new lawsuit that just came, that just came down in January uh, in San Diego. And if you read the lawsuit, because I'm a researcher, so I paid yes, I yes, wanted yes. to read that. Right? Yes. So I read the lawsuit and I was like, oh, 
this sounds like every community college. There's 116 community colleges. This yes. sounds like every campus that I'm working at right now. Because I'm the only Black person in many of the departments that I teach, and I teach in English and political science. My I'm God. the only Black female at Northridge. There's one Black male. Um, he's a Kappa. There's I'm the only one at so many different locations. So it leads me to this question of, I'm thinking of uh, the feedback that I continue to keep getting is for them to consider you know, the union. And oh, yeah, of course, of course. It makes me consider that I, sh I people don't understand the community hmm. college system. Hmm. The union does nothing for discrimination, for um, you, uh, and, and you have to pay out of pocket for these discrimination uh, complaints. Because oh, yeah, the union that was the, uh, yeah. <laughs> at so, all. Right. So my question becomes, should we begin to start thinking of in L.A., we didn't have just we didn't have segregated uh, unions. Right. So we didn't have black segregated because we didn't have segregation amongst blacks and white schools in the same way that the South did. So I'm beginning to think, should we begin to start focusing on the black uh, the uh, unions and how they were focused on civil oh. rights issues because the way that things are set up right now if you are not full time then you have no way of influencing the union to begin to start looking at uh, civil rights issues or uh, civil justice issues or so it's like that research and trying to to consider um, because I even myself has filed a complaint. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm right. ready to take it to the next level of lawsuit. Right. I'm only popping back in because your your audio is really challenging and it's hard to hear um, your question. So uh, I just want to I want to just do that. Can you answer a question? Yeah, I think it's interesting. You know, uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Thank you, Doc. Um, it's funny. I just got the uh, latest issue of the Encoach Journal. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the uh, uh, National uh, Black Political Science Organization is very important. You know, we, maybe we should hope, even do a whole uh, piece on that one day. Um, you know, you probably know the uh, union busting has been a priority over the last 50 years of the right wing in this country. I think it was a 2016 case that came out of California, Fredericks versus California Teachers Association with the attempt to do uh, to undermine unions by having those who didn't want to contribute dues not have to. Um, and the idea that you have to come out of your own pockets and of course, adjunct labor is a, is a huge thing. I think we're re really reaching a crisis moment. Well, we, we've been past the crisis moment, but this COVID has accelerated the crisis moment in higher education. Um, and that's particularly ironic in a place like California. Uh, those of you who know uh, Clark Kerr, who used to be, who was, who was the, uh, chancellor of the University of California, Berkeley, and then became chancellor of the whole UC system. Uh, he's kind of like, there's a, there's a two volume work called The Blue and the Gold, which writes about this. Kerr was, in, is credited with being the architect of the California system. We know it's a three tiered system. You have the community colleges, which have been traditionally affordable. People can have access. Then you have the California state system. And you heard Dr. Elizabeth talk about Cal State Northridge, uh, Cal State LA. So many of my, my, my friend and colleague, Melina Abdullah, for example, who's the Black Lives Matter LA teaches. Uh, so many other places. And then you have the University of UC system, the flagship of which being, of course, University of California, Berkeley. The idea is that ostensibly you could come in at any point in that system and move around in the system to get what you want and the credits transfer, this kind of thing. But we know, of course, that public education is under is under uh, is funded by public dollars and is traditionally historically underfunded. And when you start talking about now and we typically think about education in terms of students, because, of course, that's why the institutions exist. Unfortunately, now we're thinking uh, we don't think as much about the faculty and when we do think about faculty. We think about people like, you know, my friend and brother Cornell West and folks that. But that's not really where the faculty operate. The vast majority of faculty in university systems in this country, particularly the community colleges and the state institutions and the HBCUs, by the way, are teachers. They're teaching faculty. But the idea of tenure and prestige and all this stuff uh, requires that. Uh, the pipeline to that comes to what they call 
uh, probationary or tenure track appointments, full time jobs, which ostensibly will lead to tenure. And the evaluation system that's set up for that is publications, you know, teaching and service. They give lip service to that being important. Hence, you heard people say publish or perish. Yeah. But what Dr. Elizabeth is talking about isn't even that track, which is increasingly narrowing. And as Scott Galloway talks about, I saw Scott Galloway on, I really can't watch Bill Maher because I mean, so retrograde, it's embarrassing. It should be, but I know he don't care and I don't care. So therefore, but last night, uh, probably the best uh, segment I've ever seen on so-called real time, Scott Galloway out of New York University, who just be laying fire to everything. Uh, he, he has said previously that, you know, a lot of these quote unquote elite schools are basically hedge funds where they let in the children of the investors for an education and then they sprinkle a few uh, a few of the um, uh, ch children from the middle class and the poor who have superior grades and other so they can uh, so they can assuage their guilt. So what you then see, but in California, what, uh, what, what Dr. Elizabeth is talking about is the adjunct or Pro, uh, the non-probationary faculty. In other words, when she says I'm teaching at several universities, that means they're getting paid peanuts and they got to stitch together three, four, five, six or more classes taught at different universities just to get enough money up to pay the rent. And I'm talking about, you know, and, and, think, and think about that. She has a PhD. Has you a PhD. That. That's you know right. what that requires, right? You know how much debt most people go into to get these degrees no to then make a, a salary that is so under underpaid to to do the most important job because it's the adjuncts. I'm a distinguished lecturer at Hunter. Yes, I, you know I sit in a special seat and get special salaries. It's all as good as gravy based on my work. Cornell West and many others. We won't sit here and name. You know, don't do the work that Dr. Elizabeth is doing. Oh no, the, the actual work of teaching. She got a grade papers. You got a great paper. I got a great paper. Great paper. You. Yeah, but uh, you know, not as many as you do. Not as no, many no, no, no. But 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 the fact that we have to. I mean, and this, again, this isn't shade to our colleagues, but let's be very clear: the people you see, who you know as professors, they haven't graded a paper in years. They have teaching us. They got armies of teaching us. They don't grade papers. They talk to themselves and leave. <laughs> that's it. And and that's not a critique. No, but it's just a larger question, which is how we actually got here. What is university? What is college for? You know, well, you get that paper and it's supposed to give you access to the job place, right? You're supposed to be able to, you know, the relationships that you make at a Howard or Harvard, you know, yes. allow you access. It's the relationships. Is it the paper? Is it the relationships? You know, how, how if people right now are watching, they have parents or they themselves are spending a grip, yes. $40,000, yes. 60000 to go to school. Yes. Many of them are telling us in the chat, I'm learning more on Saturdays and I've learned my whole entire education. You're like, well, right. why, why am I, why am I doing this? And then you have teachers like Elizabeth and others, and I know many adjuncts. Some are homeless. You know, how, how do you have a PhD and you can't afford to live, especially in New York? People right. living in their cars. That right there tells me everything about this broken system that we need to fix. You so, know what? Don't, don't, don't. Please don't, don't leave, uh, Professor Hunter, because this is something. Two things: narrative. This is what coming out of your mind and attracting folk who are having these conversations, this is where you're now shining the light on us. I was reading something, you may have seen this uh, a couple of days ago, Google has unveiled uh, a series of classes that they're going to make available for like $250 where you get the skill. It doesn't matter. You don't have, there's no licensure required. You can be somebody dropped out in the third grade or you can be somebody with 15 degrees. You can learn these skills for these jobs. And you talk about jobs in the tech industry that are going unfulfilled. I remember I sent it to a few colleagues and I said, this is now the end of the HBCUs. Ooh. If you don't understand that the if you're making the rationale for historically black colleges, for example, that we are providing points of access into the industry, into job, you have to understand. Please understand that that is a retrograde mentality. The thing that we have to focus on includes developing the soft skills, the thinking skills. And I don't just mean critical thinking. I mean, the kind of conversations we're having right now. And the price point is going to have to crater. It's going to have to go down because Google is getting ready to put everybody out of business who is saying, come here to get this skill and pay this high tuition. Google said, for $250, we're going to let you do it from the comfort of your home. They're getting ready to wipe everybody out. Understand, and this ain't nothing they just came up with. COVID has accelerated the trends. 
So what Scott Galloway is saying is that Harvard ain't never going to close. Stanford ain't never going to close. His school, NYU, ain't never going to close. Why? Because they are hedge funds. Johns Hopkins, where my friend Lester Spence speaks, that is a hedge fund. Understand that their money is tied up in investments. Their money is tied up in acquiring property. Their money is tied up in the intellectual property of patents. So people say, I'm going to get the Moderna vaccine. I'm going to get the Pfizer vaccine. I'm going to get Johnson Johnson. The, one, the scientists who are subsidized at universities, that's why they ain't giving it away. Why? Because in, in a month now, they're going to be another person that said, look, now we've got a vaccine. Why? All that stuff is for profit. It doesn't mean that it won't help us. We need it. Get the shout outs kind of thing. But understand that we're not talking about education. We're talking about capitalism. Now, that haven't been said. Hmm. What is narrative doing? Narrative is stripping. No, no, I'm sorry. I started to say narrative is stripping away all that. No, it's not. Narrative is building the world we want to live in. So if you're a 13 year old, if you're a 93 year old, and you're with us on Saturdays, and now you're over on the narrative side, and you're learning at your own pace, how the hell can we have grades is something where people are teaching themselves. We're closing the gap between what you know and what you want to know. And the more you know, the more you contribute. And then as it's crowdsourced, what ends up happening? All those places that are going to implode, all those places that are going to uh, have to be remade, are going to have to rethink everything from accreditation to licensure, because if Google and others like that, basically Google, Apple and Amazon, quite frankly, uh, 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 Galloway was talking about that last night. One fifth of the economy in this country in terms of the Fortune 500 goes through four companies. So let's be very clear. When they put everybody out of business, people come flocking over here. We're going to invest. Everybody slow your roll. We got the model. What we're not about to do is price people out of their own liberation. Now, Ebony's question. I'm Ebony. I'm sorry. I'm somebody else. Dr. Elizabeth's uh, observation about organized labor. This is why I end. It's very important. The attack on unions is very deliberate because the only thing that can push back against capital in a capitalist society is labor. And labor has to be organized. Organized labor is the greatest threat to extreme inequality as it relates to employment. California is not typically been a union hostile state. Although it is hostile to unions, all states are, but it isn't as hostile. The Friedrichs case in 2016 was deliberately launched to undermine unions as a matter of federal law. That's why it ended up in the Supreme Court. People say elections don't matter. The judges are all the same. I suggest you ask people in organized labor. Now, within organized labor, however, we got a problem. You got racism. You got organized labor not doing what it needs to do. Is it better to have organized labor than that? Absolutely. But if you're going to organize and have organized labor, it is important. It is important to identify interests that you can force the organizational formation you're in to address. So that, for example, in California, I use a quick example from years ago, some before any of us were born. We've all heard of Congressman Ron Dellums, uh, the late Ron Dellums. I knew Congressman Dellums. Congressman Dellum's father, C.L., coming into the Bay Area, was one of the founders of the early organizers of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and Chambermaids. That was, of course, A. Philip Randolph when these black men and women were working on the railroads with no organized labor. And George Pullman and them, you know, if you see the, the movie 10,000 Black Men Called George, or better yet, read Ty's book, Rising from the Rails, it's very important. When you organize labor, you can then throw your weight around. This is what they're doing with the Amazon strikes in places like Alabama right now. People are trying to continue to organize labor. What uh, that means in terms of academic faculty and contingent faculty is for every Karen Hunter who brings a level of expertise, a level of platform and notoriety that enhances the institution she's affiliated with, there are countless Karen Hunters who sleeping in a car, running from one school to another school, now have been able to piece things together during the pandemic because they don't have to leave their apartment or wherever they got a stable wireless connection. So they're teaching six, seven classes at anywhere from $2,500 a class to, if they're lucky, forty-five dollars or $5,000 a class. And do the math. If you're doing six classes at $3,000 a class, that's $18,000. And if you get them same six classes in the spring, that's another $18,000. And before taxes, that's $36,000 before taxes. And you in New York City. That hell you going to do with that? That's before taxes. And you're teaching 12 sections that might be 20, 30, 40 students apiece. All you doing is grading papers. So 
We are building, this is where the support comes in. We're building a space where if enough people, if enough of us support this space, we will create the learning space here. And some of those people, maybe even many of them, depending on how many folk we get. In fact, we say many can come into this space, begin to subsidize, maybe even transport their work here. And you're a young person who's having a challenge trying to figure out how to work through these reading exercises or do this math or figure out that come on over here and get it with a cultural grounding. And the next thing you know, when it's time for you to apply for a scholarship or it's time for you to go to school at these reduced tuition places because they're going to have to, they can't con continue to sustain the price point, your skills are better than the other people applying, except you develop those skills in conversation and then work through narrative without the pressure of somebody saying high stakes testing and all that stuff. We build in the space. That's how it all works together. But Dr. Elizabeth, I would say you got to organize. It's got to be organized labor. That just means finding the people who are willing to make common calls and continue to struggle. And um, I'm sure you know some of those people in Cali, um, but you know if you drop your email in the chat, I'll certainly link you with the folks I know out there, and we can continue the conversation. And and thank you for your service. I mean, I don't think oh, we no question. I don't think we thank people enough who are doing that work in the classroom at all levels, grade school, high school, higher education. Yes. Our teachers are some of the most valuable, or the most valuable in our in our in our country in our world. And uh, anybody that's out there doing it, I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Especially you, Dr. Carr. Especially. No, you. no. Thank you. Thank you. Look, Karen, you know, the beautiful thing about us. I mean, for me. This is all like you said, this is all you would do. This is all I would do. And in fact, now it's a chance to do what we would be doing anyway. I had a, a an interesting conversation because, uh, you know, everybody's getting the vaccine. Now we're thinking about going back in the fall. I said, please make please don't make any mistake about this. We're not going back to what was going on before. And if we could, I wouldn't go. So <laughs> people say, well, is this what y'all do in class at Howard? It's close enough, but guess <laughs> what? you ain't got to go to Howard no more. You ain't got to go. And we got some of the best. We got some of the best there is. Wait till y'all get on the narrative side and be like, what? Yeah, but you ain't got to pay that tuition. All you got to do is drop them a few pennies and <laughs> come on on the other side. You be like, dog. And then I promise you the last thing I'll say. This is what I love about it. We are firm. We're all firm believers that we all have something to contribute. But that means we all have something to contribute. So the folks that have been saying the same thing over and over again in 30 second bursts on documentaries, the folks who come in with all the, the theater and stuff, which is great. And you hear them say the same thing twice. We thanks for your contribution. We're going to need a little bit more or not because we got people who have never had access That's it. who want to contribute, except they don't have to now roll up their leg and show leg to the producers, the showrunners at MSNBC and C-SPAN and, and the fact. No, 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 no. This is us now. And you can come, too. We want you to come. But if you say the same thing three Saturdays in a row, I guess I guess we all found out you need to get your weight up a little bit. Why? Because we trying to build a liberation train. And we want everybody. So, yeah, that's and what that's I'm what, also finding, though, is those same people have been so conditioned because there are certain things that 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 I don't want to call it white facing space, that other space they're requiring you to do X, Y and Z. They have a checklist, right? Yes. So and, you know, regular folk open the mic. We're going to have a regular conversation about important things, but it's it's not, you know, on a script. And no. I find a lot of academics are having a hard time being asked questions and not following the, the norm that they're used to. We are so conditioned that when you try to flip the table, some of us don't want, we don't, we don't want to, you know, lean into that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to people liberating themselves too. some of these academics who are used oh, to please. in a certain we kind want, of way. We like want I'm that. Looking forward to that. So we want that. I, I see Elizabeth put it in the chat. She's What's teaching that? 15 classes this spring. Oh my God. No, yeah, that, and that's not that's not not a, oh that's crazy. And the, I understand the union is white dominant; it's not representing blacks. That is the problem within unions. And I, we literally talked about this last week in my law school class. We were going over a chapter that has a lot of labor law in it and employment law. The unions aren't representing us, which means oh, I, I would ask who is who is the affiliate? Like we were having a conversation last week about SEIU, for example, which is you know considered to be one of the more progressive unions. But if they're not representing you, then 
there has there have to be new formations born. And sometimes that requires going outside the union to organize as well. And and building spaces where we can pay people what they deserve to get. No question. How that. How about that? <laughs> How about that? Go ahead. Yes. Right. How about that? Dr. Carr, love you. Thank you, everyone from everywhere, you. wherever you are. Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth Urias and everybody in uh, that, that contributed today. And we will see y'all wherever we see you. Uh, actually, yes. next Saturday. Y'all got homework, too. So. Oh, wait. Hold on. Let me one more time. What? Just so we say, because it is the anniversary, I guess we should mention the Grenada Revolution. That's the one I got my hands on. This is before Ronald Wilson Reagan, the gladiator invader of Grenada, took out Maurice Bishop and them. And for those of you who've seen the movie Heartbreak Ridge with Clint Eastwood, take that part of your brain where Heartbreak Ridge is and take some water and wash out the memory because that's propaganda. The Grenadian Revolution is something everybody should at least mention. I'll mention it next week. I just wanted to mention that, Dr. Uh, Hunter, Professor Hunter, before we go on, because since this is the anniversary today. I appreciate you. All yeah, right. Love you, Doc. Love you, too. Love you too. See you. <laughs>